Hey guys, welcome. Can you see and hear me? Is my audio visuals clear? I'm just waiting for you all to give a thumbs up so that I can uh, start the session. Yes, okay. So I think we are all set to go and really sorry for the delay. Hi guys, hi guys, good evening. Happy to see you all. Happy Saturday. And yes, so the main reason why I couldn't uh, start on time today is like as usual, my Saturday OPDs, like it tends to be really hectic. So today, in fact, I restricted my appointments uh, to approximately around only like 23, 20, 20 to 25. So, but still like there have been a lot of sick cases. So it got a little bit delayed. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Meet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for the love. Okay. So what is the crux of today's session? So today we are going to discuss predominantly on the nephrology part. So there are some quite a few important areas as far as nephrology is concerned. So I've given elaborately on what are the most important topics and uh, the 20 questions which I'm going to discuss are going to be the most important. So you can take it for granted. So you're going to get from one of these areas, the same questions may not be repeated, but the same topics are the ones that are going to be repeated as far as the exams are concerned. So just look at these 20 different areas so that you will be understanding things in a much, much better way. So let us move on to the session. Cool. Okay. So here's your first question. So we're not only going to discuss on the nephrology alone. So we'll be discussing on acid-based disorders because when it comes to nephrology, you have to discuss on acid-based disorders as well as the electrolyte imbalances as well. So here's your question number one, a 26 year old guy presented with unconsciousness. Let us say that he went to a party last night and did not pick up their calls since then. So I think uh, this is an appropriate question for today because most of such cases are going to come in the early Sundays, in the morning of early Sundays, maybe at 2 a.m. in the Sunday or 3 a.m. in the Sunday after a Saturday night party. So I guess probably like some medical students who are not attending this lecture might be like presenting like this tomorrow. So what do you think is going to be the answer for this? So, okay, let me show you the values alone. PDF will be shared. Uh, don't worry about it. I'll share both the annotated as well as the non-annotated PDF in the Telegram group. So no need to worry about that. You'll be getting both annotated as well as non-annotated PDF. So here is the sodium value. 133. Potassium is 3.8 milliequivalents per liter. Chloride is 99 milliequivalents per liter. Bicarbonate is 26. Urea is 30. Creatinine is 1.1. pH is 7.27. PO2 is 55, look at the PO2, PO2 is 55 and PCO2 is 59 millimeters of mercury. So what do you think is the right answer? So people are commenting B, C, D. So you're commenting on all types of possible answers. People are asking me to increase the volume. Is the volume okay now? I think it's actually peaking up. So I don't think uh, here after if I increase the volume, it's going to be better. So I think the volume is better now. Okay. So first of all, what is happening over here? Yeah, thank you so much. So what is happening here? This patient is having a respiratory failure, man. So that's what you need to know. So basically this is a case of respiratory failure. So when you are looking at a problem with regards to acid-base imbalance, you don't only see the values. You see the clinical case scenario and you see whether the patient is having adequate oxygenation and ventilation or not. You also look at the patient ventilatory status and the oxygenation status that you are going to look for. So this patient is basically having a respiratory acidosis. That's what is happening here. So but before that, let me tell you the normal values quickly. So what is the pH? What is the normal pH? It's going to be 7.36 to 7.44. This is going to be the normal pH. So what's going to be the normal PaO2? That is partial pressure of arterial oxygen. That's going to be somewhere around 75 to 100 millimeters of mercury. 
but everyone has to know what is going to be the critical PAO2. So what do you mean by critical? Critical PAO2. So when you call it as critically low PAO2, whenever the PAO2 is less than 60 millimeters of mercury. So there are a lot of reasons why this number is set as a critically low PAO2 because this 60 magical number is located in the steep part of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. That's why once the PAO2 goes below 60, your uh, saturation is going to fall down very rapidly. So that's why you should not allow the PAO2 to be less than 60. That's a true definition of respiratory failure in fact. So then coming to PACO2, that is partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide. It is in the range of 36 to 44 millimeters of mercury. I can see one or two questions on why, I mean 60 is the critically low PAO2. So look at this diagram. Okay, look at this diagram. So uh, you know the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. You have the PAO2 here. That's the partial pressure of arterial oxygen or arterial oxygen tension. On the other hand, you are going to have saturation of oxygen in the hemoglobin, right? So you know the curve is going to be steep like this, okay, in the middle part. But in the beginning and in the ends, it's going to be flat. So it's going to follow something called as a sigmoidal shape. So why we are taking the arbitrary number as 60? Because 60 is going to be located at this point somewhere. In the sense, till the PAO2 of 60, how much ever the PAO2 falls, till the PAO2 of 60, how much ever the PAO2 falls, there won't be much fall in the saturation. Because you can see at the end it is flat. So even if you are going to reduce the PAO2 up to a level of 60, it's not going to cause a significant impact in terms of your saturation. But the moment your PAO2 goes below 60 millimeters of mercury, there's going to be a dramatic fall in the saturation. For every small change in the PAO2 below a value of 60 millimeters of mercury, there's going to be a dramatic fall in the saturation. That is why in most of the intensive care units, you keep a PAO2 target of at least 60 millimeters of mercury. That's a very, very important point. So that's why that 60 is what we call it as the critically low PAO2. So what is the normal PACO2? It is 36 to 44 millimeters of mercury and the average is going to be 40. So what's going to be the normal sodium? Normal sodium is going to be uh, 136 to 144 millicolons per liter or you can write as 135 to 145 also no harm. What is the normal potassium? It is going to be 3.5 to 5. If, if you write 5.5 also is fine, but uh, in general, in practice, we keep a value of 5 as the upper cutoff. So 3.5 to 5 millicoulons per liter. What is the normal chloride? It's going to be 95 to 105. Some textbooks say 96 to 104. It doesn't matter. 95 to 105 millicoulons per liter. And what is the normal bicarbonate? Normal bicarbonate is going to be 22 to 28. Again, there's a lot of variations in the textbooks, but the average value is going to be the same. That's going to be 24 millicoulons per liter. That's the average bicarbonate. And finally, last but not the least, you need to know about the concept of anion gap also. So what is anion gap? Anion gap can be derived by the formula sodium minus bicarbonate plus chloride. And uh, I have many students have been asking the question why you don't use potassium, calcium, phosphorus, doesn't matter. There is a lot of reasons into it. If I'm going to explain the reasons, it's going to take a lot of time. So I'm not going to tell why potassium, calcium and other uh, anions are not included in this equation. But what you need to know for exams is you're going to only include sodium, bicarbonate and chloride. So this is a formula, sodium minus bicarbonate and chloride. Cation is sodium, anions are bicarbonate and chloride. If you use this formula, it's going to be less than 12 millicolons per liter. So the anion gap should be less than 12. Anything more than or equal to 12. Any anion gap more than or equal to 12 is equal to increased anion gap. Okay, it's equal to increased anion gap. So that's what you need to know for exams. And finally, last but not the least, don't forget about the respiratory failure component. Because many times I see, especially a beginner, so when a newcomer, like maybe who have completed the internship recently or probably a neat exam recently comes to the hospital they always forget to see the PAO2 and PACO2 values because many times that is going to be the most vital entity as far as ABG is concerned so if it's a type 1 respiratory failure you're going to have a low PAO I mean low PACO2 that's the most important plus or minus a low PAO2 so what is the other name for type 1 respiratory failure it is called as hypoxemic respiratory failure what you can call it as hypoxemic respiratory failure. It is low PACO2, that's the most important, plus or minus low PAO2. And many students can ask you ask me a question. Sir, 
type 1 respiratory failure is a hypoxemic respiratory failure which means the low PaO2 should be there, right? So why you are writing plus or minus low PaO2? That's what the question many students are going to ask. But understand many times the PaO2 may be normal or the PaO2 may be even high in a patient with type 1 respiratory failure. Hard to believe, but that's true. PaO2 may be normal or even high, but the most important clue in reality will be that low PaCO2 only even though that's a secondary phenomenon. So first of all, why the PaCO2 is low? That is because patient is hyperventilating. So why the patient is hyperventilating? Because the patient is experiencing hypoxemia. Once they hyperventilate, they can correct, isn't it? Some patients with mild degree of problems, they might be able to correct the PaO2 just because they are hyperventilating. In fact, the very reason for the patient uh, hyperventilating is to correct the PaO2. So sometimes if the problem is small, you might be correcting the PaO2 and patient may come with a normal PaO2 like around 80 or 75 borderline. So you cannot rule out a type 1 respiratory failure in such a situation. Or let us assume the patient has been received in a hypoxemic situation, but in the emergency patient is getting NRBM or some supplemental oxygen via nasal prongs. Let me repeat patient is getting NRBM or nasal prongs or face mask, something, patient is getting supplemental oxygen that can even rise the PaO2. So type 1 respiratory failure not always will have a low PaO2, they can have a normal or even increased PaO2 depending on the situation. That's the most important point. So don't get fooled with the PaO2. So always look at the PaCO2, that's going to be the clue. So what about type 2 respiratory failure? So in type 2 respiratory failure, you are going to have high PaCO2, that's definite, you are going to have high PaCO2. Plus or minus, patients are going to have low PaO2. Again, for the same reason, okay, patients can have either uh, low or normal, even high PaO2, depending on the situation. But the PaCO2 is the one that's going to give you the clue most of the times with regards to respiratory failure. So, how to assess a patient with respiratory failure. So let us assume. Now you are suspecting respiratory failure. So when will you suspect respiratory failure? Whenever the patient is presenting with hypoxemia, low saturation, or if you are expecting a low PO2, if you are seeing a low PO2, that is where you suspect a respiratory failure. Low saturation or low PO2, you suspect respiratory failure. So what is the next step? Next step could be either A grade or you can see PaCO2 also. Let us assume you are seeing PaCO2, you are seeing PaCO2. So PaCO2 can be low or PaCO2 can be high. Whatever may be the situation, one of the most important crucial calculations that you have to do is the AA gradient. I repeat, you have to do something called AA gradient that is called alveolar arterial oxygen gradient or simply A gradient. So again here also what you are going to see, the AA gradient, that's what you are going to see here as well. So what do you mean by AA gradient? You are going to see the partial pressure of alveolar oxygen and subtract that from the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. So the capital A is alveolar oxygen, the small a is the arterial oxygen, you are going to subtract both. So that is AA gradient. So in case if the AA gradient is normal. What will you think about? In case if the A gradient is low, what are you going to think about? Similarly, here if the A gradient is increased, what are you going to think about? If the A gradient is low, what are you going to think about? So that is for you. If you can, you can answer. So let me tell you now. Not increase, so I can write A gradient is normal. So what are you going to think about? So first, to understand this, you need to know the concept of A gradient. So what is the concept of A gradient? So you're going to have an alveoli and you're going to have something called as the basement membrane. This is called as capillary base membrane made of type 4 collagen only. And you're going to have a capillary. So this is the capillary. Okay. So what is A gradient? So you have some amount of oxygen in the alveoli that is called as P capital AO2 that is alveolar oxygen and similarly you are going to have some amount of oxygen in the capillaries. So this is called as P small a O2. 
So what are doing here? You are transferring oxygen from alveoli to the capillaries. This transfer, whether it is efficient or not, is what you are seeing. Okay, this is what you are seeing via the AAO2 gradient, where this transfer is efficient or not. So if the transfer is going to be efficient, if there is no problem in the diffusion barrier, I'll repeat, if there is no problem in the diffusion barrier, then your A gradient should be low, which means A gradient will be normal, which means there is no problem in the diffusion barrier. Diffusion barrier is okay, which means the transfer is fine. On the other hand, if the A gradient is increased, the A gradient is increased, which means the diffusion barrier is having some issue, which means there is a problem in the oxygen transfer. Something is wrong in this area. That's what is happening. So that is why you're not able to transfer oxygen into the capillaries so that the alveolar oxygen is fine, but you're not able to transfer that to the capillaries. So the PaO2, small AO2 is less. So the A gradient is increasing. Okay. So remember whenever A gradient is, I should not write decreasing here. I think uh, I confused you a bit. So A gradient is increasing. So whenever you are having a low PSO2 and A gradient is increasing, it usually indicates a type 1 respiratory failure. I'll repeat, type 1 respiratory failure. So Dr. Meet Patel is asking how to measure pulmonary capillary PO2. You need not measure pulmonary capillary PO2. So the pulmonary capillary blood is going where? To the left atrium. From the left atrium is going where? To the left ventricle. From the left ventricle it's going where? To the aorta. From the aorta it's going where? to the radial artery or the femoral artery. So to find out the P small a O2, all you need is a ABG. Okay, it's an arterial blood, that's all. All you need is some arterial blood. It could be obtained from the radial artery or femoral artery, but we prefer using the radial artery because the complication rates are less, plus accidental puncture of the veins are also going to be less. Okay. The million dollar question here is how to find out the P capital A O2. How to find out the P capital A O2. You can easily find out the P capital A O2. How? You are going to find out something called as alveolar gas equation. You are going to use something called as alveolar gas equation. So what is alveolar gas equation? There is a formula for that. So no need to mug up any complicated formulas. Just remember this formula for exam. It's very important. 713 multiplied by FiO2 minus PaCO2 by 0.8. I'll repeat 713 multiplied by FiO2 minus PaCO2 by 0.8. That's all. This is the formula that you need to know. Okay. So FiO2, you know, you know, depending on the device. For example, I'm receiving NRBM means, you know, it's going to be like 60 to 85 percentage. Venturi, definitely you'll know what is the FiO2. Face mask means you can calculate around like uh, 35 to uh, 50 percentage nasal prongs means it's going to be somewhere around 24 to 44 percentage so depending on the oxygen flow you can say what is the fraction of inspired oxygen the patient is getting that's something that's easily understandable PACO2 you know already right so this is going to be obtained from the arterial blood this is partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide only so once you get the arterial blood you will know the data on PACO2 so now just with arterial blood you will be able to find out the A gradient pretty much easily just take the PAO2, PACO2 data and look at the FAO2 and calculate the A gradient. So let us calculate the normal A gradient. So let us assume a person is coming to your OPD or simply taking an ABG. PAO2 is 95 millimeters of mercury. Okay, PACO2 let us assume is 40 millimeters of mercury. And FAO2 is 21 percentage. It is 0 0.21. 21 percentage means 0 0.21. You should not write 21. So now calculate the A gradient. You have all the data to calculate the A gradient because he's breathing room air. That's why I'm writing 21 percentage. So calculate the A gradient. So first you need to know the PAO2 minus, you know, the P small AO2 already. It is 95. So our idea is to calculate the P capital AO2. How will you find out 713 multiplied by FAO2 is 0 0.21 minus PACO2 is 40 divided by 0 0.8. So what is 713 multiplied by 0 0.21? I think you'll get somewhere around 150 maybe. So 713 multiplied by 21 percentage is 149 point something. So 150 is the answer. Minus 40 divided by 0.8 is like 400 divided by 8 is 50. So you're going to get 50. So the P capital A O2 also you found out it is 100 minus 95. So what is 100 minus 95? It is 5. So A gradient is 5 millimeters of mercury. 
which is normal or abnormal it is absolutely normal pa uh, a gradient of 5 mm of mercury is absolutely normal so how much should be the normal ao2 gradient now next question so what is the normal ao2 gradient so generally no textbooks will give you exact value they will say the normal ao2 gradient is much age divided by 4 plus 4 this is a normal ao2 gradient okay age divided by 4 plus 4 So, for example, if some of your age is maybe twenty-eight, let us assume if your age is twenty-eight, twenty-eight by four is seven. Seven plus four is eleven. So it depends on age and depends on FAO two also. It depends on so many things. You cannot straight away say this is the normal A gradient. So age divided by four plus four is the normal A gradient. But in exam, if you want to be a little liberal, anything less than thirty you can consider okay. So ideally, it should be age by four plus four. That's the formula for normal A gradient. But anywhere. If it's less than thirty, it's fine. That's going to be more than enough. Okay, so that's what you need to know. So anything less than thirty. So now you know the importance of A gradient. So now let us come back to the respiratory failure algorithm. In case if the patient is having a uh, increased A gradient, it indicates there is some problem in the diffusion barrier. That's why oxygen is not transferring inside. That is why patient is hyperventilating. That is the reason why the PaCO two is low. So it is a classic type one respiratory failure. So what I am trying to say is, even if the PaO2 is normal, you will be able to easily diagnose a type one respiratory failure using A gradient. No need to bother about the PaO2. PaO2 may be low, normal, or even high in any respiratory failure. That is not our concern. Our concern is the A gradient and the PaCO2 only. So if it increases type one respiratory failure. So if the A gradient is normal, what do you think about? Which means patient is having hypoxemia with a normal A gradient, and the PaCO2 is low. What do you think? What do you think? If the A gradient is normal, what do you think? Patient is having low PaCO2 but normal A gradient. Normal A gradient means patient is having low P capital A O2 itself. the amount of oxygen present in the alveoli itself is low that's what it means so tell me one condition it's a physiological condition where the patient's alveolar oxygen itself will be low what is the condition alveolar oxygen itself is low because it's low here the transfer to the artery and capillaries is also low and that's why you have hypoxemia you have low pao2 but the a gradient is normal because whatever is inside the alveoli itself is low that much only can get transferred into the capillaries yes one of the important physiological conditions everyone knows is high altitude correct high altitude one of the most important physiological conditions where you are going to have low oxygen pressure so what occurs in high altitude remember in high altitude the oxygen concentration doesn't change that's very very important point the fio2 doesn't change there is a theory that says even in the international space station that is located 400 kilometers in the low earth orbit above sea level even there the oxygen concentration can be 21% okay so the fio2 doesn't change that much it's around 20 percentage only but what reduces is the barometric pressure so you know isn't it you have some uh, the law stating that the net pressure okay the net partial net pressure of any gaseous mixture is equal to sum of press, partial pressure of individual gases sum of partial pressure of individual gases right so which means the net barometric pressure in the atmosphere will be equal to partial pressure of oxygen plus partial pressure of carbon dioxide plus partial pressure of nitrogen plus partial pressure of water and so on because as you move up and up and up and up the barometric pressure reduces you are going to have a fall in all of the partial pressures which means the pao2 is going to drop that is the main problem why you develop hypoxemia in high altitude that is because of the fall in the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere not because of change in the fio2 that's a very important point in fact that is asked in exams i guess so one reason is high altitude what is reason number 2 so if i'm uh, in the rounds in the critical care unit for example i am a intern standing in the critical care department in the icu my professor is asking what is the cause of 
low PAC O2, hypoxemia and a normal A gradient. If I say high altitude, you will see me like this two times. Are you staying in high altitude? No. Rather, what do you have to say? Low FAO2 states. So where you can get low FAO2 states? Very simple mechanical causes like uh, circuit related problems where circuit is broken or circuit is disconnected or maybe some fat staffness is standing on the tube and feeding the patient who is intubated. So some like uh, circuit related causes going to be the usual reason for low FAO2 states and that's going to reduce the amount of oxygen in the alveoli that's going to in turn reduce the P small AO2 so that the A gradient will be normal because there's no problem in the diffusion barrier. So whenever you have an increased PaCO2, increased PaCO2 and A gradient is normal, what are you going to think? This is a classic type 2 respiratory failure. This is a classic, 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 classic type 2 respiratory failure. Type 2 respiratory failure is often due to something called as alveolar hypoventilation. Alveolar hypoventilation. Here the patient is not breathing, that's the problem. Again, I'll repeat here the patient is not breathing. Which means the alveoli has to ventilate, isn't it? You have to ventilate. Ventilation is very important. Alveoli is not able to ventilate. Patient is not breathing properly. Either it could be low respiratory rate because of central causes, head injury, opioid intoxication, morphine, cocaine, Okay, something, benzodiazepine intoxication, some central cause preventing you to breathe, preventing you from breathing or reduced tidal volume, okay, reduced tidal volume, low tidal volume where the patient will have a shallow breath, not able to take adequate tidal volume. This occurs in neuromuscular causes, neuromuscular causes, okay, so these are the cause of Alveolar hypoventilation. What are the neuromuscular causes? You have Gulen Bar syndrome. Examples, lot of examples. Gulen Bar syndrome. MND, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, poliomyelitis, neuromuscular blocker poisoning. So plenty of examples I can keep on saying. Alveolar hypoventilation. That is typical type of respiratory failure. Here the patient is not breathing properly. The diffusion barrier is intact. It's not having any problem in a pure type of respiratory failure. That's why the patient is having a normal A gradient. But because the patient is not ventilating, you know the marker of ventilation is CO2. Ventilating more, CO2 will be washed out. Ventilating less, CO2 will be high. That's why CO2 is high here. So what about the increased A grade? So when you see increased A grade, it's a mixed picture. Many times you will encounter a mixed picture. So what is that mixed picture? Type 1 and type 2 together, mixed picture. So... When you what what usually will happen? Patient will initially have a type one respiratory failure, but because of tachypnea that is uncontrolled, patient will have fatigue of respiratory muscles. Patient will have fatigue of respiratory muscles because of fatigue of respiratory muscles. Patient slowly will get weakness, and that will result in type two respiratory failure subsequently. That is mixer, which means PaCO2 is also high and A gradient is also high, which means diffusion barrier is also affected and patient is not ventilating properly also. Both are there in this situation. That's it. So this is how you are going to approach a patient with respiratory failure. Remember, again, I'm repeating that PaO2 may be fooling you. Don't believe on the PaO2 all the time. So these are the concepts behind type 1 type 2 respiratory failure. I think most of you would have got the concepts of type 1 type 2 respiratory failure by now. Okay. So now let us come back to our original question. And before that, you need to know what are the causes of different problems that occur in the acid-base imbalance. So first, you need to find out what is the pH. You need to find out the PaCO2. You need to find out the bicarbonate as well. Anytime, whatever may be the abnormality, the first thing in the step one, first thing that you're going to look at is the PaCO2 and the bicarbonate. You want to see whether the arrows are moving in the same direction or the arrows are moving in the opposite direction. That's what you need to see. Okay. Arrows are moving in the same direction or arrows are moving in the opposite direction. This is the first thing you need to see. 
if the arrows are moving in the opposite direction that is one is decreasing one is increasing arrows are moving in the opposite direction one decreasing one increasing what you will do close your eyes and in the exam write mixed disorder i cannot close my eyes and write sorry but what i'm going to do write as a mixed disorder just close your eyes okay don't do anything look see mixed disorder write as a mixed disorder that's it nothing more than that no need to even look at the problem from there on many times you can solve using this simple concept arrows are moving in the opposite direction makes a disorder many times the problem is the arrows will be in the same direction only that cannot tell you whether it's a single disorder or makes a disorder okay so in that situation you have to evaluate further but i'll tell you some easiest clues so if this is the condition okay if arrows are moving in the same direction in the next step look at the ph look at the bicarbonate and look at the paco2 okay just look at these three things and tell the interpretation tell the interpretation so if pa bicarbonate is decreasing ph is also decreasing and paco2 is also decreasing all three moving in the same direction so what is the primary here the primary is metabolic acidosis so here the primary disorder is metabolic acidosis that's why the ph is showing acidosis see whichever direction uh, the ph goes whatever that correlates with the ph that should be the primary so here the primary is metabolic acidosis because the ph agrees with low bicarbonate you know that if the pso2 is going to be primary there should be alkalosis not acidosis so this must be compensatory okay this must be compensatory if ph is increasing bicarbonate is increasing carbon dioxide is also increasing again it's very clear this must be primary because ph is increasing only increase bicarbonate can lead to alkalosis not increase pso2 if increase pso2 is primary that should have resulted in acidosis only so this must be compensatory response okay here the primary disorder is metabolic alkalosis here the primary disorder is metabolic alkalosis in case if the ph is decreasing bicarbonate is also decreasing sorry bicarbonate is increasing and pso2 is also increasing both are moving in the same direction look at this here the increased pso2 is the reason for low ph that's why this must be the primary and this must be the compensatory response because increased bicarbonate should have led to alkalosis only but if it's not the case it cannot be the primary the increased pso2 is the primary so here the problem is respiratory acidosis and next look at this one so if the ph is increasing bicarbonate is decreasing and pso2 is also decreasing it's very clear that low bicarbonate cannot produce increased ph so this must be the primary the low pso2 is the only thing that can produce increase in ph in the form of alkalosis and this fall in the bicarbonate should be a compensatory response so this is what respiratory alkalosis here the primary is respiratory alkalosis okay as simple as that so now you can understand what's going on so this is how you find out what is the primary disorder and what is the compensatory event i didn't tell you the average ph what is the average ph the average ph is 7.4 so even though 7.36 is 7.44 is normal understand very clearly if you take abg for me if my ph is 7.38 nobody is going to tell i'm suffering from acidosis and nobody is going to admit me so this arbitrary number of less than 7.4 equal to acidosis and more than 7.4 equal to alkalosis should be taken only in clinical situations where the patient is having some trouble somebody is asking what is partial compensation and what is full compensation let me tell you that concept because you have asked that already what is partial and what is full compensation it's quite simple it's pretty easy no need to confuse anything so you know like in the metabolic problem so see in the metabolic problem what is the compensation so in a metabolic problem in a primary metabolic problem your compensation is going to be respiratory and tell me respiratory compensations so respiratory compensation respiratory compensations will be fast or slow you are breathing every minute at least at a rate of 12 to 20 per minute right as an adult so which means respiratory compensations must be fast and respiratory compensations will be quick but they will not be accurate they will not be efficient they are fast but they are unlikely to be efficient they will be inefficient so what do you mean by inefficient so why you get compensation in the first place why any compensation happens in the body in the first place to 
change the pH, isn't it? So the metabolic problems are changing the pH. Metabolic problems are changing the pH, but I don't want the change in the pH to occur. That is why my compensatory responses are occurring in the first place. So inefficient in the sense, the pH will never come back to normal. Never come back to normal. Which means, as a quick rule of thumb, I can say, respiratory compensations will always be partial. It can never be complete. You cannot bring the pH back to normal with the help of respiratory compensations. Because there is a limit to how much you can hyperventilate. I'll repeat, there is a limit how much you can hyperventilate and how much you, can, you, you cannot hy you, you can hypoventilate. You cannot cross that level. For example, the least PaCO2, how much ever you hyperventilate in metabolic acidosis, the least PaO2 that you can get is 10. Below that you cannot go. That's the least PaCO2 that you can reach. Which means there is a limit for respiratory compensations. But that's not the case for kidney compensations. That is why for respiratory problems, you know what is the compensation. For respiratory problems, you know compensation is coming from the kidneys. Kidneys are the ones that are going to compensate for respiratory problems. But kidney compensations can be very, very, very effective. Even though it is slow. Slow in the sense most of the compensate response are going to start by around like 40 to 72 hours. It will not occur before that 40 to 72 hours. But they are going to be very efficient compensations. Very, very efficient compensate responses. Efficient in the sense they can bring the pH back to normal. That's why kidney compensation are slow, but they're going to be very efficient, which means most of the times, if you give time, renal compensations will be complete, full. But the problem is you need to give time. That's a very important point. So in a primary respiratory problem, you can, based on this data, you can say whether it's an acute or a chronic respiratory problem. If it's an acute respiratory problem, the compensation will be poor. Compensation will be very poor because kidneys can't compensate fast. It's going to compensate only after some time. So the compensation is going to be very, very poor. So in acute respiratory disorders, the change in the pH, the change in the pH will be more. There will be more change in the pH. There will be rapid drop in the pH. But in chronic respiratory problems, the compensations will be very, very good. Very, very good. In fact, most of the time, the compensation will be full. It won't be partial. Rather, it will be full compensation, which means the change in the pH will be very, very negligible. There will be a negligible change in the pH, which means most of the times, patients can even have a normal or a near normal pH. Okay, near normal pH in chronic respiratory disorders. That's why we can say it's a full compensation. Now, what I can say as a quick rule of thumb, metabolic compensations are almost always, I mean respiratory compensation due to an underlying metabolic problem is almost always going to be partial. Acute respiratory disorders will be uncompensated, usually compensations will be very poor, whereas chronic respiratory disorders often tend to have a full compensation. I think you can get it. Primary metabolic problems, respiratory compensations are always partial. Acute respiratory problems, compensations usually will not be there, so it's a no compensation situation. Chronic respiratory problems usually are going to have full compensation. This is a general rule of thumb that you need to know. So how in the world you can find out whether it's an acute respiratory problem or a chronic respiratory problem? So you are going to look at the bicarbonate. So you are going to look at the bicarbonate. You know that in respiratory problems, the bicarbonate will increase. I mean, in respiratory acidosis, the bicarbonate is going to increase. How much it has increased is going to give you a good idea about whether it's acute or chronic. So it's going to increase. Definitely it will be more than 24. There is no doubt about that. If PSEO2 is high, if it's a good compensation, bicarbonate will be more than 24 without a doubt. But whether it is more than 30 or whether it is less than 30, that's the question. The bicarbonate is more than 30. I'm going to call it as a chronic respiratory problem. And if the bicarbonate is less than 30, but more than 24, remember if it's less than 24, it's a mix set because bicarbonate is coming down, PSU is increasing. That's a different situation. But if it's more than 24, but less than 30, it's an acute problem. It's a 
acute respiratory problem because the bicarbonate change is very poor. So what's going to happen? If this is the case, the pH will be almost near normal. We know that because there is a very good renal compensation, the pH will be near normal. But here, there will be a gross decline in the pH. Gross decline in the pH. Grossly, the pH will be low if this is the case. On the other hand, similarly, in a respiratory alkalosis, look at the bicarbonate again. So definitely, it will be less than 24. But how much it is low is going to give you the clue. If it is very low, like less than 20, very, very low, which means in the sense there is a good compensation, bicarbonate is falling to very low level, less than 20. You can call it as a chronic respiratory alkalosis. If it's going to be more than 20, if it's going to be more than 20, I can say it's an acute respiratory problem. Okay, because the compensation is not that good. Kidneys are not compensating better. So it's an acute respiratory problem. So what will be the change in the pH? Remember in a chronic respiratory alkalosis, change in the pH will not be that much. So the pH will be near normal. That's why it's a full compensation. In acute, the pH increase will be rapid. Okay, so the pH increase will be gross. There will be a gross change in the pH. If it's a acute respiratory alkalosis, the pH increase will be gross. So these are the ways to pick up whether it's a acute respiratory problem or a chronic respiratory problem. You know you would have studied Winter's formula, all those things, but these are some things that are quick tricks in exam to find out whether it's acute or chronic. Simple. So everyone knows the compensatory formulas, but there's no need in most situations, compensatory formulas. Just look at the clinical data and look at the numbers. That's going to tell you. So whether, what's going on? Look at our patient. What's going on in our patient? Simple, easy. So first of all, this patient is having a low PaO2 with a high PaCO2. That itself tells this is a definite type 2 respiratory failure. Okay. We don't know what the patient is breathing. FaO2 is not given. So it's very difficult to calculate the A gradient. So I'm not going to do that because straightforward the PaO2 is low, PaCO2 is high. I can say it's a type 2 respiratory failure. And what is the acid-base disorder that is going on? Look at the pH. pH is 7.27. It is less than 7.4. So it is an acidosis. Patient is having acidosis. Look at the bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is more than 24, which means bicarbonate is increasing. Bicarbonate is increasing. So look at this. Bicarbonate is increasing. PaCO2 is also increasing. Arrows are moving in the same direction. Bicarbonate increasing. PaCO2 increasing but the pH is decreasing. Okay, so what's there here? I cannot say it's a mixer disorder right away, but I'm sure that it is a respiratory problem. Because in a metabolic problem, pH, pCO2, bicarbonate, all will go in the same direction. Because it's not going in the same direction, it is a respiratory problem for sure. But to say it's a mixer, arrow should move in opposite direction, but that's not happening here. Arrows are moving in the same direction. So what is the primary here? The primary problem here is respiratory acidosis. We all know that. Now, it's your call to say whether it's an acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. I've told you so much about this, right? So tell whether it's an acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. Acute or chronic respiratory problem. What is going on here? So two clues are there. Now you have found that it's a primary respiratory acidosis. That's a primary. But how to say it's an acute or chronic? So look at the bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is going to give you the clue. Bicarbonate is giving you the clue. So bicarbonate is less than 30. Okay, bicarbonate is less than 30. And look at the change in the pH. pH has grossly changed. Normal pH is 7.36 to 7.44 or 7.35 to 7.45. There's a gross change in the pH. Okay, bicarbonate less than 30, gross change in the pH. So this must be an acute event. It's an acute respiratory acidosis. As simple as that. That's what you're going to find out. Simple. There's no, I mean, uh, technically speaking, there is very, very little compensation. That's correct. So because it's acute, that's why the compensation is very, very little. Uh, Pavitra is telling acute respiratory disorders partial compensation. So no, no. For acute respiratory disorders, don't use the term partial compensation. Generally, acute respiratory problems will have very poor compensation. So you reserve that partial compensation for metabolic cases. Generally for metabolic cases with respiratory compensation. For that, you can use that partial but be very careful in acute respiratory acidosis. Generally, there will be very poor or no compensation. Okay, so that's what is going to occur. So how can I say it's very poor to no compensation? Because even though you say 24 is the average value for bicarbonate, the correct bicarbonate number is 22 to 28. 
and look at the bicarbonate. It's 26, which means as per your range, it is still normal, which means the compensation is almost zero. There's no no compensation at all. So that's what that's a be be very careful for metabolic problems. You say partial respiratory compensation, but for acute respiratory problems, be very careful in using partial. It won't be usually partial. It will be either very minimal or no compensation. That's what you need to think about. So what are the things that are going to cause uh, uh, this kind of problem? So it's very simple, you know, like alcohol intoxication. So this is the one that's going to produce such an issue. Okay, he went to party last night and he's knocked out completely. He's having acute respiratory dose and that's because of alcohol intoxication. As simple as that. So beer potamania would have resulted in severe hyponatremia, but I need other data to substantiate. Patient should be euolemic and I need the urine osmolality data we discussed already in the endocrine section. So I'm not going to talk about that. So that's a, just a dummy choice because uh, I know some students who have prepared very nicely might think the sodium is low 133. So they might think one of the causes is beer potamania, but I need urine osmolality to confirm it's a beer potamania. Otherwise, I will not be able to confirm it. And 133 will not cause a symptomatic hyponatremia. Usually, uh, it should be at least less than 130 or usually it will be less than 120 to produce a very symptomatic hyponatremia. So what about cocaine intoxication? Cocaine intoxication and MDMA intoxication will result in excessive sympathetic uh, excess in the body. So sympathetic excess is going to be there. So patients will be having hyperthermia. Generally BP will be high. Patient will be having hyperthermia. Okay, patient will be having high heart rate. Patient will be sweating usually. Patient will be sweating usually many times. Okay. And in sympathomimetic toxin syndrome, plus or minus patients can have midriasis because of high sympathetic activity, midriasis. Okay, these are the clues in exam. And patient can be in altered mental status, plus or minus patient will be in altered mental status. So this is how you diagnose a sympathomimetic toxin syndrome because you know cocaine, MDMA. MDMA is also called as ecstasy. Everyone knows that. MDMA also called as ecstasy. Okay, these are all going to cause sympathomimetic toxin because they reduce the reuptake of the monomines. Noradrenaline is one of the important monomine. So the concentration of noradrenaline will be more in the synaptic terminal. So other clues will be there if it's going to be cocaine or MDMA intoxication. So that's what you have to look for. And if it's an opioid poisoning, if it's an opioid or benzodiazepine poisoning, how will you find out in exam? It's pretty much simple and straightforward. Both of these conditions will have hypothermia hypothermia that's very important both will have hypothermia both can have low respiratory rate both patients will present with coma okay these are common features between opioid and benzodiazepine okay but remember opioid patients will have pinpoint pupils okay pinpoint pupils whereas benzodiazepine patients will not have they will have normal to even dilated pupils okay but opioid poisoning patients will have pinpoint pupils that's going to be the key anyone who's coming with hypothermia young patient 20s low respiratory rate bradypnea coma okay think about opioid and benzodiazepine opioid pinpoint pupils that's going to be the clue you know what is the antidote for opioid poisoning it is naloxone what is the antidote for benzodiazepine you don't use generally in clinical practice even though in pharmacology textbooks they would have given us flumazenil but we don't use it in clinical practice because use of flumazenil increases the risk of seizures because benzodiazepine suppress flumazenil is an uh, opposite to that it's going to stimulate the brain so it can result in seizures so risk of seizures is very high with flumazenil so generally what we do in benzodiazepine poisoning is just intubate them observe them once the benzodiazepine effect goes off you just extubate and send them home after psychiatric counseling that's what they're going to do don't use flumazenil that's controversial supportive care that's it Okay, so I think now you'll be a little clear about like what's going on in the acid based disorders. Most of the problems, trust me, as far as ABG is concerned, will be very, very simple. Okay, especially when it comes to NEAT exams. Maybe in INACT exams, some tough questions will be there, but that also can be easily cracked just by looking at the clinical data. For example, many people talk about, say, I don't have time right now to teach all those things, but many people talk about the delta delta gap uh, many times. Even I, I have taught that in many classes, delta delta gap, the uh, urinary anion gap and all those things but look at the clinical picture man so one of the aims questions asked like uh, a year ago i guess they gave like a patient is suffering from renal failure and vomiting and the entire abg was normal so how can you rule out a acid-based problem in a patient who's having renal failure and who's continuously vomiting so just look look at what's happening renal failure going to cause metabolic acidosis 
Vomiting is going to cause metabolic alkalosis. And that's what the answer for the question is. High end gap metabolic acidosis with metabolic alkalosis. Always see the clinical picture properly. If they are given it, that's going to give a very, very vital clue. Okay, in exams, never ever ignore the clinical history. Okay, with next in hand, most of the questions may be clinical, but be very sure to read them carefully and answer it. Don't jump into a conclusion straight away. Okay, I think every one of you will be knowing the causes of Nagma and Hagma. I think I've discussed in many of my prior sessions already. In one of my PYQ sessions, which I conducted first in the cerebellum platform, I told about the cause of high end gap metabolic acid, normal end gap metabolic acid. So you can just go through them. It's not a problem. Look at this second question. You have 56 year old obese man admitted with respiratory failure after pneumonia in the ICU when he became more septic and went into septic shock along with acute kidney injury. They said that he will need renal replacement therapy soon and you are asked to get a dialysis catheter. Which of the following statement is true? So this question is about uh, the dialysis catheter. The option here states femoral site is associated with increased risk of infections than jugular vein. Uh, Subclavian vein is preferred due to least complications. Right jugular vein is preferred over the left jugular vein. The catheter diameter should be about half of the vein diameter. Most of the exam questions will be like this only. Don't worry about that. The reason for that is either you will be obviously knowing the answer or you can easily rule out the options. Always, whenever you don't know the question, read the question, read the options and see whether is there any obvious right answer. Second, try to rule out the option. These are the easier two ways to find out what is the right answer in a given question. So let us look at each and every option. Option A states femoral site is associated with increased risk of infections than the jugular vein. Answer is no. This is a wrong statement. If you maintain the catheters properly, the risk of infection is going to be the same as that of femoral and the jugular vein. There is no change in the rates of infection in an ICU patient or patient who is undergoing renal replacement therapy. Okay, there is no difference. Infections are going to be the same. I mean the risk of infections is the same. You might think that it's near the genital area, so the risk of infections will be high, but not. If you maintain properly, it should be the same risk. No change in the risk is going to occur. And I'll tell you two more additional points. Whenever you have a catheter, okay, whenever you have a central line catheter, let me write CVC. Whenever you have a central venous catheter, whenever you have a central venous catheter, CVC, if you, uh, there are two things, isn't it? Clapsy. So what do you make clapsy? That's called central line associated bloodstream infection and we have CRBC that is catheter related bloodstream infections. So central line associated bloodstream infections and catheter related bloodstream infection. There are subtle differences between them but both are almost the same. So in exam think about CLAPSI the most common organism is going to be staph the gram positive cocci. It could be either coagulase negative staphylococci or it could be uh, staphylococcus aureus also but CONS is the most common cause of this central line associated bloodstream infections. CLAPSI. Second, subclavian vein is preferred due to least risk of complications. Of course, it is wrong. First of all, knowing the anatomy, you should say that subclavian is associated with high risk of complications because it's close to the lung apex. So pneumothorax risk is high. Second, it's close to the major vessels like aorta and subclavian vein is close to subclavian artery also. So there is a risk of puncture and it's behind the clavicle also. So it's very difficult to uh, control the bleed if at all it occurs. In the neck, it's easy to control, isn't it? You can press it, but behind the rib, it's very difficult to compress. So risk of complication is higher. And another reason is usually nephrologists hate subclavian. They hate subclavian. If you go to the nephrology ward and if you're going to um, cannulate the subclavian vein and they're going to be very, very angry on you. So they're not going to allow you. The reason for that is subclavian vein is prone for stenosis compared to the jugular vein. Even if the jugular vein goes for stenosis, it's not a problem. But if subclavian vein goes for stenosis, the future AV fistula production will be compromised. So you have to get an AFISLA because this patient has a lot of risk of going for CKD, chronic kidney disease. And in the setting of chronic kidney disease, you need an AV fistula, which is the gold standard way of vascular access in a chronic kidney disease patient. Acute kidney injury, fine, you're going to go for the central lines. But in chronic kidney disease, the gold standard is AV fistula for vascular access. It may be like possible or not possible, that's different, but that's the gold standard. You have to attempt for the AV fistula. And if subclavian vein is stenosed, you will not have maturation of the AV fistula. You will not be able to get that at all. So that's dangerous. You should not do that. No subclavian. And right internal jugular vein is preferred over the left internal jugular vein. Absolutely correct statement. Okay. So this is correct. So generally left internal jugular vein is not straight. It's going to uh, follow a curved pathway. So it's not easy to cannulate it. Risk of uh, failure and complication is a little high. But we are going to prefer the right internal jugular vein. It is straight going down into the SVC and into the right atrium. So that's preferred. 
Option D, the cathode diameter should be ideally half of the vein diameter. That's wrong. Why it's the wrong data? Because it should be ideally one third of the vein diameter. See, this is a question that I prepared exactly from Harrison. Okay, nothing more than that. So whatever is given in Harrison, I've given the statements. That's it. So nothing more than that. All of these four options can be individual questions in your exam. So what is the second important topic? You need to know a little bit about rail replacement therapy. So whenever you want to know what are the indications for RRT, whenever you need to know what are the indications for rail replacement therapy in acute kidney injury. Chronic kidney disease, it's very difficult to determine. A lot of pros and cons about RRT when to start and all. But in acute kidney injury, we have some standard guidelines. You're going to use a mnemonic called as A-E-I-O-U. These are vowels. Not only English, these are vowels in any language for that matters. In any language, let it be Hindi, let it be Tamil, let it be English, French, everywhere. A, E, I, O, U are going to be the vowels. So because vowels and consonants are basically not based on letters, they are based on sounds because these are language based data, sounds. Okay, let us go back. So what is A, E, I, O, U, vowels? What does it mean in RRT? Indications for RRT. So A stands for acidosis. A stands for acidosis especially refractory acidosis okay if you're not able to correct that acidosis at all you can start second e e stands for electrolyte imbalances electrolyte imbalance in acute kidney injury what is the most important electrolyte imbalance hyperkalemia that's what is going to kill the patients most of the time if it's electrolyte related death so hyperkalemia especially if it's refractory hyperkalemia you have tried your basic measures but it's not working you're going to go for dialysis third i stands for intoxication 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 with dialysable drugs so what are the dialysable drugs we have a mnemonic called as blist med c this is a mnemonic i used to tell to the students blist med c this is a mnemonic what does b stands for b stands for barbiturates you know the properties of a dialysable drug right you have to you have to have a low volume of distribution low protein binding and uh, the molecular weight also should be low so l stands for lithium i stands for inh that is isonic acid s stands for salicylates and T stands for theophyllin and aminophyllin. T stands for theophyllin and aminophyllin. M stands for methanol. And I can write two more drugs also. Metformin and methotrexate are also basically dialysable. But uh, often it is underestimated. This uh, metformin and met methotrexate both are dialysable. And E stands for ethylene glycol and propylene glycol. Not just uh, methanol, ethylene glycol and propylene glycol. D stands for depocote. So this is a brand name for something called as valparate so depocote is a brand name for valparate so valparate in high concentrations can be dialysis even though valparate has very high protein binding many students ask a doubt that how um, valparate can be dialysis because the protein binding of valparate is very high but in toxic concentrations the protein binding sites will be saturated so that a lot of free drug will be available in the plasma that will be eliminated so in toxic conditions yes valparate is also dialysable and another important drug is dabigatran. So why dabigatran is important? That is because this is the only anticoagulant. I'll repeat, only anticoagulant that is dialysable. Okay, only anticoagulant that is dialysable is dabigatran. Okay, you cannot dialyze warfarin. You cannot dialyze other dual, I mean, direct oral anticoagulants like apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, or uh, something. You cannot dialyze. Okay, any of them. Only dabigatran is the only uh, anticoagulant that is dialysis. Even heparin cannot be dialysed. Okay. So only thing that you can dialyze is dabigatran. That's why that point is very, very important for exams. And what about C, carmazepin? That too in toxic doses, it can be dialyzed, carmazepin. So what are things that cannot be dialyzed? Even that is the important point, isn't it? So you know barbiturates. Okay. I've told barbiturates. What is the other drug that works similar to that of barbiturates? Benzodiazepines, right? So they cannot be dialyzed. Benzodiazepines cannot be dialyzed. So some people is somebody is answering diazepam. It does it cannot be dialysis because it has a very high protein binding. That's why. So you told lithium, right? Lithium is a antipsychotic drug or maybe anti-manic drug. That's fine. But it comes under the psychiatric group of drugs. So what are the other psychiatric drugs? You know, maybe depressant drugs like TCAs, SSRIs. These drugs cannot be dialysed. You know that, right? So these drugs cannot be dialysed. So now you know that. Uh, Dabigatran can be dialyzed. I told you other anticoagulants, other anticoagulants except dabigatran cannot be dialyzed. Except dabigatran, including warfarin, cannot be dialyzed. And we have talked about metformin, right? So metformin is an anti diabetic drug. What are the other anti diabetic drugs? Most of that are anti diabetic drugs, but in exam, most commonly they will have sulfonurias. These drugs cannot be dialyzed because of heavy protein binding. 
and most importantly dig cannot be dialyzed what are the other cardiac drugs some are drawn heavy protein binding very large volume of distribution you cannot dialyze warf as i told you very important exam they cannot be dialyzed so this is what they will ask in exam these drugs cannot be dialyzed you can't and anything that has very high molecular weight like for example protein proteins cannot be dialyzed what are the examples of proteins monoclonal antibodies okay any glp1 analogs insulin how can you dialyze them you can't insulin no it's a protein you can't it's an it's a peptide monoclonal antibodies no very large molecules proteins you cannot dialyze so you cannot dialyze proteins you cannot dialyze monoclonal antibodies okay dig cannot be dialyzed amiodron cannot be dialyzed okay warfarin cannot be dialyzed okay so you have to know about certain drugs that cannot be dialyzed as well so these are the indications of dialysis in intoxicated situations so what about o o stands for overload okay volume overload state again refractory volume overload so what is the clinically important volume overload state patient is having a refractory pulmonary edema that is not responding to diuresis you have tried maximum dose of lasix the patient is getting refractory pulmonary edema not improving dialysis u stands for uremia so not for all uremia but three important uremic complications one is going to be uremic pericarditis why in uremic pericarditis you dialyze because patients will have a platelet dysfunction uremia pericarditis means inflammatory surfaces in the pericardium because the patient is also having platelet dysfunction in uremia and patient is also having inflammation of the pericardium you can bleed into the pericardium that can result in tampon and that's why we take this patient urgently for dialysis second is uremic encephalopathy altered mental status because of raised icp cerebral edema third is going to be uremic bleeding patient is having severe bleeding because of uremia and but what if they ask you what is the first thing you will do in uremic bleeding if somebody asks you patient is having severe uremia bleeding out so what is the first treatment you have to answer desmopressin ddavp that is desmopressin that is the first treatment that you have to choose in case the patient is bleeding because of uremia okay i told you the most important points with regards to dialysis but other things are also important which can be asked in exams third which of the following is true regarding acute interstitial nephritis so option a states eosinophilia is not in approximately 25% of the patients with acute interstitial nephritis option b states antibiotics are implicated in 60% of the cases of drug induced acute interstitial nephritis and option c states uh, 40% of patients taking nsh typically develop nephrotoxin option d states renal ultrasound is diagnostic of acute interstitial nephritis remember an is a very important topic for exams an is basically divided into three different causes okay so what are three different causes of an first one is drugs second one is uh, i can write infections third one is going to be connective tissue disorders could be idiopathic also but very rare it could be due to ctd connective tissue disorders so what about drugs drugs causing acute interstitial nephritis so what are the drugs usually antibiotics so what are the two groups of antibiotics sulfa drugs sulfonamides sulfonamides and beta lactams like penicillin cephalosporins all those drugs very common second it can be caused by nsaids nsaids are very very important culprit in any country they can cause acute interstitial nephritis and third is proton pump inhibitors this could be asked in exams as well these are upcoming drugs ppas also can cause an so what are the infections there are plenty of infections that can cause acute interstitial nephritis in the world but in india the most important infection is leptospirosis very very important any lepto patient acute kidney injury think about an that is acute interstitial nephritis that's it it could be due to tuberculosis fine but tb causing an not very commonly we see in india even though india is a capital of tuberculosis we see other forms of tb and pyelonephritis also can cause acute interstitial nephritis and even legionella can cause acute interstitial nephritis but lepto is the most important infection so what about connective tissue disorders ctds plenty of ctds can cause acute interstitial nephritis sle very very important okay then jogren syndrome okay then rheumatoid rheumatoid arthritis rare but sle jogren syndrome and there is a syndrome called as tinu syndrome okay tanu that's called tubular interstitial nephritis with uveitis when our patient is having uh, interstitial nephritis with uveitis think about tinu syndrome and finally we have something called igg4 related disease this is an upcoming disease we'll talk about this disease in the rheumatology discussion igg4 related disease these are three conditions that commonly tend to be asked in exams okay connective tissue disorder producing acute interstitial nephritis how they are going to present 
so common presenting feature aka acute kidney injury and many times many times it can fool you patients can be non oliguric patients can be non oliguric you know oliguria is one of the important signs of aka but acute racial nephritis can be oliguric non oliguric patients can be having normal urine output the most important clue will be rise in the serum creatinine that's the important clue and patients can have other symptoms depending on the underlying cause and patients will have cause in the urine what type of cause in the urine they are going to have wbc cause okay patients are going to have wbc cause white blood cell cause this is a very very important clue and patients can have sterile pyuria so what do you mean by sterile pyuria even though patients can have wbc cause if you look at the urine culture it will be negative this is a strong clue lot of wbcs in the urine but patient is having a negative urinary culture lot of wbcs in the urine but negative urinary culture okay that's an important clue again so in exam whenever they say wbc cause the first possibility that you are going to think is acute intestinal nephritis and sometimes the urine eosinophil levels can be increased urine eosinophils even this is a very important clue vital clue in exam urine eosinophils can be increased and plus or minus patients can have eosinophilia also plus or minus patients can have eosinophilia as well urine eosinophils will be definitely high plus or minus patients can have eosinophilia as well so these are the vital clues plus or minus proteinuria patients can have proteinuria but it will not be a selective proteinuria but it will be less than 1 gram only it will not be very high level proteinuria or not non selective less than 1 gram proteinuria and most of the times what what is this protein is nothing but the tubular proteins they, these are basically tom horsfall proteins you know that they are coming from the tubules so this will be the usual picture classic picture gold standard for diagnosis biopsy gold standard for diagnosis biopsy and generally what occurs is the antibiotic no anti where is the antibiotic antibiotic related an will be allergic antibiotic related an will be allergic so additionally they can have rash also they can have rash because antibiotic related an will be allergic usually the typical allergic reaction patients can have additionally rash also okay that could be the clue so option number a eosinophilia has noted in approximately 25% of the cases that's correct so which means i told you patients can have plus or minus eosinophilia which is seen only in 1/4 of the patients 25% of the patient that's very very correct option 2 states antibiotics are implicated in 30 60% of the cases of drug induced an no that's wrong among the drug induced causes antibiotics are responsible for 1/3 of the cases one third of the cases this is i mean all these are basically harrison statements straight lines from harrison nothing more than that so one third of the case of drug induced an will be due to antibiotics not 60% 40% cases 40% of patients taking nsaids will develop nephrotoxicity that's wrong this is easy to rule out because in your practice how many nsa how many patients you have given nsaids out of that do you think 40% develop nephrotoxicity no the risk is 1 to 5 percentage but still this is a huge number even if it's 1 percentage imagine how many people are taking nsaids in the community and even if it's 1 percentage if 1000 people are taking 10 people are at risk so that's why nsaids is not at all a good drug you have to be very careful so 1 to 5 percent develop not 40 percent renal ultrasound is diagnostic of an no you don't see anything in renal ultrasound in fact renal ultrasound will be totally normal in most patients okay so you're going to have uh, i mean gold standard for diagnosis as i told you is biopsy biopsy is the gold standard so treatment will be treatment of underlying cause for example if it's drug induced you have to withdraw the drug if it's infection give antibiotic if it's connective tissue disorder then probably you can use immunosuppression like corticosteroids corticosteroids can be tried in drug induced an also but it should be tried very early if you try late it may not work early it may work but ctd is definitely are going to use steroids infection give drugs antibiotics and in drug induced an withdraw the particular drug that you are suspecting to have caused acute interstitial nephritis so this is about an we have discussed that already coming to the question number 4 you are seeing a 20 year old man who complains of edema and frothy urine for 2 months labs reveal a normal serum creatinine and a 4 plus protein in the urine without blood or bacteria he undergoes a kidney biopsy which is normal in light microscopy which of the following is the best treatment for the patient very easy straight forward are you going to use tacrolimus are you going to use cyclophosphamide are you going to use cyclosporin are you going to use corticosteroids so what is going to be the right answer for this
Okay. Many of you have commented already. So the right answer is option D. Um, it's a very simple one because we know that the patient is actually having a minimal change disease. It's very simple, easy. So what are the different causes okay, of uh, nephrotic syndrome? So there are plenty of causes. We have minimal change disease. We have membranous nephropathy. We have uh, FSGS. But in exam, most of the times, as far as I've seen, I don't know why they are obsessed with minimal change disease. They tend to ask a lot of questions on minimal change disease. So how will you diagnose minimal change disease? Look at a patient, child. Okay. So secondary is there. But we are talking about primary minimal change disease. Primary minimal, minimal change disease patient is going to be a child, very young child, often males. Often males. Okay. Often male children. We don't know why. And they are going to present with edema. The mother is going to get very scared. They are going to present with edema. Edema. And apart from that, if you see the serum creatinine, it will be normal. Look at the blood pressure. It will be normal. It will be the urine analysis. You will not see any RBCs. In the urine, all you are going to see is massive proteinuria. So what do you mean by massive proteinuria? You are going to have protein leakage of more than 3.5 grams per day. That's what you are going to see. More than 3.5 grams per day. That's called massive proteinuria, nephrotic range proteinuria. Otherwise, you are not going to see any RBC cast generally. You might see in some cases, but you will not see in a classic situation. Okay, everything will be normal. The only two problems will be edema and this will be a sudden onset edema. It will be a sudden onset edema. All of a sudden the child will swell, swell up, the child will swell up and that worries the mother so much, brings the child to the hospital. You look at the urine, child will have severe proteinuria. Everything else is okay. So what are you going to do? You start therapy. Because this is a classic presentation okay, of minimal chain disease. 80 to 90 percent of the children with nephrotic syndrome will have minimal chain disease only. So start therapy straight away. So what is the first line therapy? You are going to start with corticosteroids. Prednisolone. That is the first line therapy. So when you are going to do biopsy, remember you are going to do biopsy only when they don't respond to steroids properly. So when you are going to do biopsy, if they don't respond to corticosteroids. So when you say patients are not responding to corticosteroids, there are two options. Either patient is having a steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome or patient is having a steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. There are other categories which I am not going to say because this much at an undergrad level is more than enough. So steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome in the sense. So patient is getting improvement. The proteinuria is getting better with steroids. But the moment you start tapering the steroids, it's worsening. You start tapering the steroid, it starts worsening. So that is steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. It, so the disease will not allow you to stop the steroids, taper and stop the steroids. And steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, patient is not having satisfactory improvement with steroids. Even at high dose steroids, patient is not improving. That is steroid resistant. And there are some frequently relaxant types also, which I don't want to discuss right now. So in case, if this is the issue, then you are doing biopsy. So why you are doing biopsy? Mainly to rule out congenital cases of nephrotic syndrome. There's something called congenital nephrotic syndrome, especially to rule out that particular entity only, you are doing um, biopsy. In case if it's a minimal chain disease, if you're doing biopsy, in case if it's going to be minimal chain disease, all you're going to see is a normal light microscopy. That's what you're going to see, normal light microscopy. So tell me which condition, apart from minimal chain disease, will produce a massive protein in a normal light microscopy. Answer is nothing. <laughs> Understand? These names are actually derived from your light microscopy findings only. Which other disease is going to produce a normal light microscopy picture but a massive protein area? Nothing. There is no other condition. The moment you see a normal light microscopy, massive protein area, nephrotic presentation, it is going to be minimal chain disease unless proved otherwise. That's it. That's why the name came minimal chain disease. You don't see any change in microscopy but you are having massive protein area. So that's the only condition. You don't need technical electron microscopy. That's what I'm trying to say. In fact, in the beginning, you don't even need a biopsy. And for most patients, you don't need electron microscopy at all. It's only for research purposes. Why? This itself is going to be diagnostic. In case if you're going to see electron microscopy, all you see is many people have commented already are going to see effacement of food process of podocytes or fusion of food process of podocytes, something like that you're going to see. But whether it's required or not, answer is definitely no, it's not required. And why it is often overemphasized in the pathology textbooks? Why? Because 
That's the only change that's seen in minimal chain disease. Effacement of food process of podocytes. Is it a specific finding? Answer is no again. You can see effacement of food process of podocytes in many other podocytopathies. FSGS is a podocytopathy. Membranous nephropathy is a podocytopathy. So in many other podocytopathies, not just in minimal chain disease, you are going to see effacement of food process of podocytes. But why it is clearly given in textbooks? Because it's the only finding seen in MCV. That's why. So what about secondary case of MCV? The most important are going to be two drugs. NSAIDs and lymphoma. Hodgkin lymphoma. Any lymphoma can does that. But in childhood, you know that Hodgkin lymphoma is going to be the most important. So NSAIDs and Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, these are the two important causes of minimal chain disease. That's it. In case if they ask you for steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome, what are you going to do? You can answer cyclophosphamide. In case of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, you can use calcium neurin inhibitors like cyclosporin or tacrolimus but you can use anything not a problem if there is any difficulty you can even add rituximab if you want if there is any difficulty you can add an anti cd20 monoclonal antibody called as rituximab so how to treat the steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome is like uh, or resistant nephrotic syndrome is like topic for me there are so many protocols that are available which i don't want to discuss but these are the general treatment options Cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin tacrolimus, rituximab. These are the usual options for any primary nephrotic syndrome. Remember, any secondary nephrotic syndrome, the moment you hear secondary treatment of the cause, that's all. Why you want to use uh, steroids here? Just treat the cause if it's secondary. Primary means you're going to go for immunosuppression. The right answer is going to be corticosteroid. Cyclophosphamide, I'm going to use typically in steroid dependent cases, but even in steroid resistant cases sometimes. Cyclosporin tacrolimus I will be using in steroid resistant cases but you can use that in steroid dependent case also no problem but it's not the first line the first line best treatment for this patient is going to be corticosteroids okay what about this question 11 year old developed sore throat fever to 103 degree Fahrenheit tender lymphonopathy and the patient is having a tonsillar exudate which of the following is the first line drug that helps to prevent the PSGN that is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis which of the following will help you or a first line drug to prevent the post streptococcal glomerulonephritis? Is it penicillin or is it clindamycin or is it erythromycin or is it none? So what is the answer? Okay, I am looking at the answers given by you. So many people are answering A, many people are answering B, many people are answering C. Some, somebody is answering C as well. But the right answer for this question is option D, none. Okay, there is not even a single drug that has been prone, I mean, that has been shown to prevent PSGN. You can't prevent PSGN. That's why if you want to prevent PSGN, the only option is to treat the community. First of all, prevent the streptococcal infection from occurring. That's the only way to prevent PSGN. There's no other way. No antibiotics have been shown to prevent PSGN. It's a community problem. It's not a problem of, of uh, what antibiotics you're going to use. Okay, so let me tell what do you mean by PSG in the first place. That is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So it's a GABHS, that is group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. Again, this is based on one line that is given in Harrison, clearly given that PSG can't be prevented. If you get streptococcal infection, if you're prone to develop it, you're going to develop it. There's no doubt. You're only going to treat after that. So GABHS, that is group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. So what is the most common organism It's going to be streptococcus pyogenes that's the most important organism over here you know the microbiology i'm not going to talk about that right now so what it can produce it can produce uh, either skin infections or it can go it's going to produce pharyngitis or it's going to produce pharyngitis pharyngitis or skin infection skin infection means common it will be impetigo in children so both can result in development of psgn both can result in development of acute glomerulonephritis Okay, acute glomerulonephritis. But if it's going to be skin infection, the incubation period will be different. Incubation period will be one to three months. Whereas if it's going to be a pharyngitis causing acute glomerulonephritis, it's going to be one to three weeks. That's a very important incubation period. One to three weeks for pharyngitis. And one to three months for skin infection. Yes, pyoderma sometimes can, but most important is impetigo. Okay, acute glomerulonephritis. But how will you prove? So what is the feature of acute glomerulonephritis? All you're going to have is hematuria. In fact, this is the main problem in the patient. This is the only problem in the patient. Suddenly, mother sees like a lot of blood is coming in the urine. 
I mean, you would have studied in pathology, Coca-Cola colored urine, tea colored urine, chocolate colored urine, whatever it is. You see some dark colored urine. Mother is very scared. She brings the patient immediately to the hospital. And you will see urine. Okay. Plenty of RBC cars. You're going to see a lot of RBCs with dysmorphic RBCs and RBC cars, which clearly tells it's a glomerulonephritis. This RBC cars are going to prove 100% it's a glomerulonephritis because RBC cars are at most specific for glomerular injury. You're going to have RBC cars. Plus or minus, you can also have WBC cars, honestly speaking, in this condition also. But don't think about that in exam. The RBC cars are going to be the clue. But how will you prove still? See, you are proving it's an acute glomerulonephritis only. But how will you say it's a PSGN? You have to prove that there is evidence of streptococcal infection. You have to prove it. The patient should have evidence of streptococcal infection. So what are the ways to prove? Okay, either you do a throat. Okay, either you, either you take a throat culture sensitivity, throat swab. That can be positive. But this is very rare because patients are going to present late, not in the acute infectious period. If you're going to take cultures in the time of like exudate, that time you might get positivity. But you will not get positivity because it occurs after one to three weeks, most of the time. Look for the enzymes, yes, and the antibodies, ASO titer. Or you're going to see ADB titers. Either you can see ASO or you can see anti DNSB titers. These are two things that are very commonly available in India right now. But apart from that, in the Western world, they also tend to use anti streptokinase titus. And you also have something called anti hyaluronidase titus. Any one of these titus can be seen. But in India, it's a common practice to use both ASO and anti DNSB titus together. So, ASO and anti DNSB titus together. That's what we do in India. Because ASO titer alone, the sensitivity is 70%. ADB titer alone, the sensitivity is 70%. But you know, when you are adding two tests with similar sensitivity, the overall sensitivity will increase. It becomes 95%. So when you add both these things together, it's going to become more than 90 to 95% sensitive. That's why it's a common practice in India to use both the titers together. Here's on ADB. Okay. If it is positive, it tells you for sure. So either you can use a throat swab, culture sensitivity, or we have some rapid antigen testing also. Okay. Alternative for culture sensitivity is rapid antigen testing. Okay. That is RAT. Alternative is RAT, rapid antigen testing. That's also available like COVID. So that also can be positive, but they are very, very rarely positive. So usually what we use is ASO plus ADB. Now tell me, clinically you are having evidence of glomerulonephritis in the presence of hematuria and RBC cast. And you are already proving that the pain is having streptococcal infection, evidence of streptococcal infection by ASO or ADB titus. Do you need biopsy? This combination itself can tell you it's PSGN, right? Do you need biopsy? Tell me, do you need biopsy or not? Here. Biopsy is not required, technically speaking. So because it's a clinical diagnosis. Look at the evidence of global nephritis and prove that it's because of streptococcal infection. It's PSGN, that's all. You just start treating. What is treatment? Conservative. Conservative treatment. How you are going to monitor for it? Because conservative in the sense you are going to manage only the complications. Like for example, give antibiotics if you feel some residual infection evidence is there. Just treat conservatively. That's it. Nothing more than that is required because they have excellent prognosis. The prognosis is going to be very, very good. More than 95% of the children will recover without any sequelae. On the other hand, how will you monitor? Because you cannot just like that leave, isn't it? Name of conservative monitor. You have to monitor. How will you monitor? C3 levels. This is very important because PSGN is a condition that's going to reduce the C3 level. So monitor with C3. C3 monitoring is essential, important. Okay, usually C3 levels have to fall within a period of three to four weeks generally, not more than that. There will be only trans, I mean, transient hypocomplementemia. C3 levels will come back to normal within three to four weeks, ideally. But when will you do biopsy? When will you do biopsy? Only two, can, two indications for biopsy. Number one, persistent fall in C3, persistent hypocomplementemia. If there is a persistent hypocomplementemia, do a biopsy. Second, if the patient is having persistent acute kidney injury, persistent AK, rise in the serum creatinine that is not coming down at all. These are the two indications for biopsy, important indications for biopsy. Otherwise, we don't do. In case if it's, if you're doing a biopsy, what are you going to see? All you're going to see is glomerulitis in light microscopy. That's what you see. I don't know how many of you know the difference between glomerulonephritis and glomerulitis. 
glomerulitis is what you are going to see in the biopsy which means the glomerulus will be edematous swollen with plenty of WBC infiltration swollen edematous WBC infiltration that is glomerulitis that are going to see in biopsy and if you are going to do immunofluorescence you are going to see the classic starry sky appearance but it's not required generally for diagnosis starry sky appearance or otherwise some textbooks use the term garland appearance garland appearance if you're going to do electron microscopy what you will see you will typically see sub epithelial deposits that will be lumpy bumpy deposits there will be here and there large irregular sub epithelial lumpy bumpy deposits okay that's you're going to see in electron microscopy that's it nothing more than that so like microscopy glomerulitis electron in immunofluorescence starry sky or garland appearance electron microscopy sub epithelial lumpy bumpy deposits okay so that is psgn so you cannot prevent psgn so none of this is correct answer is d it's not a tricky question it's a straight question from harrison so coming to question number six in patients with chronic kidney disease below which degree of renal function one begins to be at significant risk of 25 hydroxy vitamin d deficiency you know the problems that occurs in chronic kidney disease i'm asking at what point the patient will have severe vitamin D deficiency that is active vitamin D deficiency whether at EGFR of less than 10 or EGFR less than 20 or EGFR less than 30 or EGFR less than 40. Dr. Harsh Ketan Jakar is asking how to differentiate from IG nephropathy. Uh, so IG nephropathy is a very different disorder man. Uh, whether IG nephropathy occurs in children or not yes it occurs in children but it's very common in adults though. So what is IG nephropathy? You are going to have IJ deposits, okay, IJ deposits in the mesangium. It's a biopsy diagnosis, IJ deposits in the mesangium. But the most important point is you should not have any secondary cause, underlying cause. Remember, IJ nephropathy is a perfect example of a renal limited glomerular nephritis, renal limited problem, which means you should not have any systemic problem. That's very, 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 very important. IJ deposits in the mesangium without any systemic cause. No other systemic problem. It's an isolated glomerular kidney problem. That's it. That is IJ nephropathy. So why? Because IJ deposit the mesangium is a very, very non-specific finding. Very, very non-specific finding. It can be seen in many other conditions. Many other conditions. For example, the best example is going to be Henoxalin purpura. If you look at the, at least other diseases can, you can find out. But Henoxalin purpura, you cannot even differentiate. Okay, between IG nephropathy and uh, Henoxalin purpura if you don't look at the clinical data. So here the patient will have evidence of systemic vasculitis. Okay, the patient is going to have evidence of systemic vasculitis. They will have palpable purpura, arthritis, gastrointestinal involvement like abdominal pain, melina, hematochesia, intersusception in children. There are plenty of other problems. So look at the clinical data. They can be seen in other connective tissue disorders. The best example is ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. It can be seen in SLE. So but in ankylosing spondylitis, what will you have? You will have evidence of back pain, back stiffness. You will have other clues. Second, third, Patients can have skin problems, certain dermatological problems. The best examples are going to be psoriasis. Okay, psoriasis, where you have psoriatic skin lesion, psoriatic arthropathy. Or patients can have atopy. Okay, where the patient will have atopic history. Okay, they can develop IG nephropathy. But remember, in exam, whenever they talk about atopy, you diagnose minimal chain disease because atopy has a strong link to minimal chain disease. This is one of the old 2014 AIMS exam question. Okay, it's a very old question. That's why I didn't tell there. But atopy history is there means first exam think about minimal chain disease because atopy has a strong association with minimal chain disease rather than IG nephropathy. Other, other problems, what are the other issues? It can be associated with celiac disease and it can be associated with dermatitis herpetiformis. These will have evidence of gluten hypersensitivity. And you know, all these disorders will have some problem or other outside the kidney. But IG nephropathy can be diagnosed only if it's an isolated kidney problem. I think you can get it. That's the reason why if you see IG deposit the mesangium, it doesn't mean it's IG nephropathy. You have to see 
kidney related disease only you should not have any other secondary problem everything else should be fine then only you can diagnose ig nephropathy all right so how ig nephropathy will present generally now you understand the presentations now you know how to diagnose that's more important now how they will present so remember ig nephropathy doesn't have any clinical so this is the word that's given in harrison how important it is it's mentioned in harrison there is no specific clinical feature of ig nephropathy which means there should not be any other clinical finding that should tell otherwise some other disease apart from ig nephropathy so now what will be the possible clinical features patient will have a history of uri prodrome patient will have history of uri prodrome and after this uri prodrome how fast they are going to develop glomerulonephritis glomerulonephritis in the sense again you are going to develop hematuria with rbc cas but remember the most important thing here is it's going to be more common in adults psgn will be more common in children but take away that thought that ig nephropathy doesn't occur in children it can also occur in children that is why we have to differentiate from psgn so what is the incubation period it is less than one week the incubation period is less than one week which means the incubation period is very very less very fast they are going to develop glomerulonephritis that's why ig nephropathy is also called as synpharyngitic glomerulonephritis what is synpharyngitic synpharyngitic means they occur concomitantly with pharyngitis both occur together sometimes patient will have pharyngitic picture and they will have hematuria at the same time that doesn't occur in the case of PSGN. That's why those incubation periods are very important clues. But anyway, the gold standard is going to be biopsy only. Okay, synpharyngitic. And these are the other clues. And usually it's going to be common in adults. And hematuria will be most commonly microscopic. But in children, it can be macroscopic like PSGN. But in adults, most commonly it will be microscopic. And it's going to be most common in adults compared to the of children. In children's presentation can be atypical. They can come with macroscopic hematuria and they can present with uh, typical PS gene like picture also so that's that's why the incubation period will give you the clue so how will you diagnose look at this picture and rule out secondary causes for example in adults the most important thing you have to rule out is PS gene because you have to rule out infection related problems that's why you do anti DNS B titers ASO titers and all to make sure that it is not PS gene so you have to rule out PS gene very very important make sure that the titers are normal it's not streptococcal infection then consider starting treatment treatment is conservative only when you do steroids in case if the serum creatinine is high in case the serum creatinine is high if the pain is having kidney injury or if the proteinuria is more than one gram per day then only use corticosteroids again corticosteroids are the first line drugs prednisolone that you are going to do only if the serum creatinine is high and protein is going to be more than one gram per day otherwise no treatment required we are going to treat conservatively with ac inhibitors plus or minus fish oils fish oils are thought to be beneficial in some cases of ig nephropathy now i think you can understand the crux of ig nephropathy how to diagnose it remember it's a renal limited problem you should not have any other systemic problem that's the most important point one more time it's done let us move on i'm not going to discuss anything more about your uh, this thing and how will you rule out how will you differentiate from psgn and uh, your uh, ig nephropathy another finding is c3 c3 levels will be normal okay there will be no change in the c3 levels that's also another way to differentiate between ig nephropathy and uh, your uh, psgn and if they ask you whether complement activation occurs in ig nephropathy or not yes it does occur but it occurs locally within the kidneys and if they ask you what is the most important iga type of iga that is involved in iga nephropathy it is iga1 type it is nephrodogenic iga iga1 subtype iga2 is also with iga1 or you can call it as galactose deficient iga1 even this is an exam question that galactose deficient iga1 is what is going to be the reason for development of iga nephropathy according to pathophysiology coming back to this question so in patients with chronic kidney disease below which degree of renal function one begins to have significant risk of vitamin D deficiency is it 10 20 30 or 40 the right answer for this question is 30 okay less than 30 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square body surface area that's how we express gfr okay so remember whenever the staging of chronic kidney disease is very very important many times they have asked this question how will you stage chronic kidney disease so you have something called g staging and you have something called a staging so what is g staging g staging means gfr it is based on egfr so let me tell you one interesting thing so what about ak and what about ckd so in acute kidney injury patients will be oliguric that's a very important finding even though there are some non-oliguric ak but one of the most important findings of acute kidney injury is oliguria 
in CKD, patients will be non-oliguric. They won't be oliguric. That's a very important point again. Okay, they don't they won't be oliguria. The urine output will be at least more than uh, 400 ml per day or 500 ml per day. But remember, how will you define is very, very important. In acute kidney injury, oliguria cannot be defined on a daily basis. For example, if the patient is in ICU, I cannot wait for one full day to define an oliguria. That's why oliguria definition is less than 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour. I need to measure hourly urine output and I have to find out whether the patient is having oliguria or not. But the definition of oliguria in chronic kidney disease is different because in chronic kidney disease, patient will be having non-oliguric state. So I have time, I have to calculate per day urine output only. If the per day urine output is less than 500 ml per day, then only I am going to call it as oliguria. So understand in what context you are going to use that oliguria and non-oliguria. In AKA, things are very dynamic, it's changing, it's rapid, it's fast, it's in the ICU, the critical care, in the hospital. So you have to calculate hourly urine output. But in CKD, it's, in, it's different, it's months to years, no, it's going to be long term. You don't measure hourly urine output, measure daily urine output. It's going to be less than 5 ml per day. Then only you are going to call it as oliguria. So understand the situation where you are defining oliguria and non-oliguria. Okay, so AKA is a dynamic condition. Any acute condition is very dynamic. But CKD is a stable condition. It's a long-term stable condition. If the patient is not very sick, even though they may appear sick, but they're not very sick. You have time. So you can use serum creatinine and you are going to use urine output for defining and staging. For defining and staging acute kidney injury, I am going to use serum creatinine urine output. Why? I cannot use EGFR. I cannot use GFR for staging okay, and defining AK because to uh, measure GFR, I need to have a steady state. Okay, I need to have a steady state of creatinine. In AKI, you yourself mentioned it's dynamic. There is no steady state. You cannot use serum creatinine. I mean, you cannot use EGFR. That's why I'm using the crude serum creatinine fluctuations and the urine output to define and stage AKA. But on the other hand, for defining and staging CKD, I'm going to use EGFR and albuminuria. Okay. I'm going to use totally different parameters for defining and staging chronic kidney disease. AK, as you all know, it's going to occur in hours to days. Okay. Hours to days. It's not even weeks. Whereas CKD is something that's going to occur over months to years. It's a long term problem. It's going to occur over months to years. First, always understand uh, AKA versus CKD. Okay, so that's a very important thing. Then only you will be able to understand why we are trying to stage in a different uh, thing. Okay, so with AKA and CKD, respect to AKA and CKD. So, what about the EJ first G staging? You have something called G1. G2, G3, in that you have G3A and G3B, and finally you have G4 and you have G5. Okay, you have five stages. What is G1 staging? GFR will be more than 90. That's a normal GFR more than, see, I mean, EGFR in the sense you have to always represent by ml per minute per 1.73 meter square body surface area. That's how you have to uh, measure. So more than 90, that's a normal GFR. G2 means patient will be having GFR of 60 to 89. G3 means somewhere around uh, 30 to 59. But in the G3A stands for 45 to 59. G3B means 30 to 44. And G4 means 15 to 29. And G5 means less than 15. Okay, so this is the G staging. Which means patients can have CKD even at a normal GFR. That's a very important one. Even that's an exam question once upon a time. Patients can be diagnosed with CKD even at a normal GFR. What about albuminuria? I have three stages. A1, A2 and A3 stages. A1 means the albumin creatinine ratio. You are going to see something called spot urine albumin creatinine ratio. You don't use 24 hour urine albumin anymore or 24 hour urine protein anymore because it's cumbersome to collect. So use spot urine albumin creatinine ratio or morning sample albumin creatinine ratio. So A1 means no protein urea, which means ACR will be less than 30. If it's 30 to 299, it is microalbuminuria, that is A2, any overt protein urea. Al ACR of more than 300, albumin creatinine ratio of more than 300 is overt protein urea. Okay, that's bad, it's the A3. So what albuminuria tells, A staging is very important because as you go down, you are going to say that the progression is going to be very rapid. If the albuminuria is more, the progression of CKD will be very rapid and they will easily go to end stage lung disease in a short period of time. And the mortality rates are also going to be very, very high. Dr. Ujwal Tiwari is asking, please upload PDF. None of the PDF has been uploaded till now. Where, man, I have uploaded already. I think uh, other students will be knowing all the PDF is available in the Telegram group, man. 
I think it's available in my group as well. It's also available in Dr. Zainab Madam's group. In both the groups, I think I, I'm keeping on uploading. Okay, all the PDF, everything is available. Okay, you can download everything. Both the non-annotated PDF and annotated PDF, both are available. Okay, so increased progression. Okay, so whenever the patient is having uh, more and more albinuria, the progression of CKD is going to increase and the mortality of CKD is also going to increase. So what are the goals of therapy? So what are the goals? So in different stages, the goals of therapy will be based on G1, G2, G3, uh, G4 and G5 only. So in G1, okay, G1, you are going to treat the risk factors. You have to address the risk factors and address the risk factors. That's the most important. In G2, you are going to estimate progression. Estimate the progression. That's the most important aspect of G2. In G3, the most important thing is to uh, treat the complications because most of the complications are going to arise when the patient enters the G3 stage. So you have to treat the complications of CKD. G4, you need to prepare the patient for renal replacement therapy because they are going to move towards end-stage renal disease faster. Prepare the patient for renal replacement therapy. G5, once the G5 is also called as end-stage renal disease or ESKD, end-stage kidney disease. So if the patient enters G5, you have to consider RRT, but this is a soft indication only. RRT should be, dis uh, I mean, always decided based on individual case-to-case -case basis. You should not decide just because the patient is having a GFR of less than 15. Patient can be completely asymptomatic despite having a GFR of less than 15. And patients can be completely non-oligric, even no edema may be there, just with a GFR of 5. So you have to address this based on case-to-case -case basis. And if you think that patient will benefit from RRT, you can start renal replacement therapy. This is the maintenance RRT we are talking about. We are talking about maintenance renal replacement therapy. Okay. So consider renal replacement therapy. And list for transplantation if you think that the patient will be eligible. And list for transplant. Okay. If the patient is entering end stage kidney. So the goals of therapy is also going to be different. In one stage one you are going to address g1 you are going to address risk factors predominantly to prevent further progression of ckd in uh, g2 stage you are going to estimate progression by measuring gfr and albuminuria in g3 you have to start treating the complications okay start treating the complications because most of the complications are going to start once the gfr goes below 60 and in g4 you are going to prepare for renal replacement therapy and g5 you are going to uh, Consider renal replacement therapy. That's a maintenance renal replacement therapy and list the patient for transplantation. Meet Patil is asking, ESKD will be final stage for both AK and CKD. No, no, no. See, AK and CKD are very, very different disorders. Right? That's why I told you the difference. So the different everything. So it's totally different condition, AK and CKD. Even though AK can occur over on top of chronic kidney disease, but they are completely different conditions. Okay, you should not confuse them. You cannot use GFR in the first place, okay? In, even though you have stages of AK, stage 1, 2, 3, 4, I mean, stage 1, 2, 3 AK is there according to KDGO, but both are different. You should not confuse AK and CKD. What about RPGN? Oh, RPGN is different, okay? Because I don't know why students are again and again getting confused between that. There is something between, okay? So I told you uh, AK is something that occurs over hours to days and CKD is something that occurs over months to years. So what is RPGN? RPGN is the condition that's going to occur over weeks. So technically, uh, not RPGN, it's called RPRF. RPRF, that's called as rapidly progressing renal failure. Okay, that's a clinical terminology. Whenever creatinine doubles, serum creatinine doubles within a period of six weeks. Okay, creatinine doubles within a period of six weeks. This is what we call as RPRF. You don't use the term subacute, rather the term for that is RPRF. That is rapidly progressing renal failure. Many students think that RPGN is a pathological diagnosis. Absolutely not. RPGN is a clinical diagnosis. All you need to diagnose, you have to have evidence of Glomerulonephritis. What is the evidence of glomerulonephritis? Just look at the urine. In the urine, if you see RBC cast, hematuria, dysmorphic RBC, RBC cast, that's it. It's RPGN. So what do you need to know? All you have is RPRF, serum creatinine doubling within six weeks or like a kind of subacute progression over weeks with evidence of glomerulonephritis in the kidney. Okay, I mean, with, uh, what is the evidence of glomerulonephritis? You see RBC cast in the urine, it is equal to RPGN. That's all. There is no need of any pathology. There is no need of biopsy. I told this 
in so much of my regular classes in many of my regular classes which i take everywhere i tell the same information over and over again rpgn in practice we diagnose clinically it's not a pathological diagnosis students are not there to believe me at all every time i ask they keep on saying that rpgn is a pathological diagnosis and they say like you see crescents in rpg no crescents can be seen in any condition even chronic kidney disease can show crescents those are called as chronic fibrotic crescents crescents are just a marker of severe kidney injury that's all severe glomerular injury whenever you have a severe glomerular injury it is rp it is rp i mean it is like it's going to show crescents so i don't know how to explain that if you have acute kidney injury and crescents acute glomerular injury and crescents you will see like more cellular okay so if it's a subacute you will see more cellular and fibrosis together if it's a chronic crescent it will be fibrotic crescent whenever they say fibrotic crescent it's it's burnt out it's a chronic crescent so crescents can be seen in any form acute subacute chronic it doesn't matter at all okay that is not related to rpg and crescents just indicate severe glomerular injury that's it it's made of just fibrin and like uh, your uh, parietal epithelial proliferation that mix is what we call it as a crescent so it's based it's actually because of the damage to the glomerular endothelium and the fibrin leaks out and that stimulates the parietal cell proliferation and that mixes what we call it as crescent in microscopy that's different but rpg is totally different rprf is different so it's like subacute progression not really contrast subacute but over weeks progression of kidney injury along with the evidence of rbc cas it's just that it's rpg finish okay rprf and rpg okay in that what is the importance of g4 stage why i told 30 the importance of g4 stage is there are plenty of complications that can occur in a patient with ckd but during this g4 stage only your ckd mbd will start okay most of the patients will start developing mineral bone disease only when the patient enters the g4 stage so what is the reason for ckd mbd there are two main problems that are going to occur one is hypocalcemia second is hyperphosphatemia both will start worsening only in the g4 stage even though plenty of complications like volume overload state then um, what is that volume overload apart from that met metabolic acidosis so many problems can occur in the g3 stage itself but in the g4 only you will start developing the mineral bone disease and the most important reason for mineral bone disease is hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia what is the reason for hypocalcemia it's very simple that is because of low 25 125 hydroxycholecalciferol low 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol that's the reason for hypocalcemia so why that occurs because you know so you have something called cholecalciferol cholecalciferol comes to the liver in the liver you have 25 hydroxylase enzyme that's going to form 25 hydroxycholecalciferol which then enters the kidney in the kidney you have one alpha hydroxylase enzyme there's one alpha hydroxylase that's going to result in the production of 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol which is the one that's responsible for calcium and phosphorus absorption in the kidneys so because in kidney failure there will be low levels of 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. This is a very important point because we don't really measure 125 DHCC levels in practice. What we do is we actually measure 25 HCC, 25 cholecalciferol. So many of you will be testing for vitamin D, right? So you will have had vitamin D testing. What they are testing? They are testing 25 HCC. They are not testing 125 DHCC. You need special assays to find out 125 DHCC. So everyone goes for uh, vitamin D testing. What they are testing? This is the dietary form of vitamin D. That's why we are testing 25 HCC. So in kidney disease, 25 HCC, which means your vitamin D testing in the laboratory can be completely normal because you are not testing 125 DHCC. So that's why you need to be a little careful. In kidney disease, you have to replace calcitriol, not calcidiol. This is calcidiol. This is calcitriol. That's the active form of vitamin D. That will be low. So your serum calcium is going to be low. Number one, okay, hypocalcemia. That's because of reduced 125 DHCC. And your serum phosphorus will be increased that's because of low gfr falling gfr filtration gfr goes below 30 very low gfr so phosphorus cannot be filtered so that's why you're having hyperphosphatemia this unique combination is seen in many conditions but the most important is kidney disease okay that's why he said like at a gfr of less than 30 you're going to result in not only low levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D deficiency you're also going to result in high phosphorus hyperphosphatemia and mineral bone disease is very very common in patients who are entering the g4 stage below GFR of 30, uh, the bone related complications are very, very high. So this is the one that's going to accelerate the PTH, especially the hypocalcemia part is going to increase the parathyroid hormone. This is basically a secondary hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism. It's going to work on the bones. It's going to cause something called osteodystrophy. What is the most important feature of osteodystrophy? The alkaline phosphatase levels will be high. That's a very important point. Whenever P 
pth is high alkaline phosphorus is high that indicates bone damage if pth is high alkaline phosphorus is normal it doesn't indicate bone damage but these patients will have very high alkaline phosphorus levels okay that indicates something wrong is happening in the bones okay so that's what we call it as renal osteodystrophy okay secondary hyperparathyroidism causing renal osteodystrophy causing bone problem and fractures and lot of other problems how to treat that you need to supplement calcium number 1 and you have to correct the phosphate by giving phosphate binder. So calcium, you know, calcium alone, it's not important. You have to give vitamin D. And this vitamin D supplement should be given in the form of calcitriol. Okay. You have to give calcitriol, not calcidiol. And apart from that, phosphate binders. What are the phosphate binders used? There are plenty of phosphate binders. In practice, what we commonly use is Sevelemer. What we commonly use? Sevelemer. Okay. Sevelemer is the one that we commonly use. Phosphate binders. Calcitriol, Sevelemer. Calcium and calcitriol combination along with several to reduce the phosphate levels. These are phosphate binders which bind to phosphate and excrete phosphate in the gut. Fine. So I told you a lot of important things with regards to CKD in a nutshell. Now going on to the seventh question. You have a 42 year old uh, woman with ESRD due to IgN nephropathy received a diseased donor kidney transplant two weeks ago. She underwent an allo graft kidney biopsy due to high creatinine. Biopsy is shown as below. What is the best management? Okay, let me show you. This is the biopsy. So I don't know. So I'm a I'm not a pathology person like you. I know you know more pathology than me because of a lot of reasons. But nevertheless, what I know as a consultant is one thing that if I see a lot of blues, it's bad. That's what I know. When I see a lot of blues, it's bad. That when I'm going to see blues in between the cells, that's even more bad. It's interstitium. Okay, it's in the interstitium. And I'm not only seeing there, I'm seeing everywhere. I'm seeing blues here. I'm seeing blues over here in the interstitium, inside the tubules, around the capillaries. Okay. I'm seeing blues everywhere almost. So which means more blues, more bad, more lymphocytes. So she recently underwent a kidney transplantation. So definitely this must indicate a rejection. And I'm not seeing tubular atrophy. Look at the tubules. I mean, generally tubular atrophy is something that cannot be visualized uh, from um, high power view. Usually these atrophic changes and all will be visualizing from low power. Generally, that's how I have been taught. So atrophic changes always see in the low power view. So just superficially, if you see itself, some of the tubules will be small. That is going to tell you. So if you see in the high power, you'll not be able to find anything much. So to see the fine details only going to see in the high power. So this is actually basically a high power view. So I'm not be able to see much of tubular atrophy, but I can say, so I'm going to see like same size tubules. I'm not seeing much of tubular atrophy. I'm not seeing any fibrotic tissue. The glomerulus is okay. It's not showing any hyalinization much. So these are things I'm going to look for just superficial. I mean, in the exams, most of the time, the logic makes a lot of sense rather than like going to the details of pathology, just see the logic. So more cells, not much atrophy not much fibrosis, not much hyalinization, hyalinization in the glomerulus. So more blues, inflammation, it must be an acute rejection. It's unlikely to be a chronic rejection. Look at the time frame. So patient has recently received, isn't it? Recently received a kidney transplantation two weeks ago. How can it be chronic? It must be an acute rejection. That's it. And what is this one? So this is, I have not mentioned it, but let me mention it's a C4D staining. Okay, C4D stain. C4D stain. So whenever they say C4D stain is positive like this, they may not give you this kind of tough question, but just to make you aware of the fact that if C4D staining is positive, along with acute rejection, it, may, it becomes an antibody-mediated rejection. That's called as ABMR. That's called antibody-mediated rejection. Okay, it's, it, it is antibody-mediated rejection. So whenever you talk about acute rejection, you need to know, it's a very important question, okay, acute rejection exam. Because there is a data which says that every renal transplant individual undergoes acute rejection at least once okay at least one episode of acute rejection is something that's going to happen in almost all patients okay so that's that's the data but not always but this is the data so acute rejection may be of two types one is acute cellular rejection that is acr which is the commonest form second is antibody mediated rejection or humoral rejection whatever abmr so pathological classification for acute rejection will be BANF system. So we see the biopsy reports, okay, commonly after transplant because our hospital is a very good center for kidney transplantation as of now. So we did like almost like uh, 50 plus kidney transplants as of now in the last five years alone. 
So it's a very good center. So we see a lot of like band system, classification system. Based on that only, they're going to report that. Acute cellular rejection versus antibody mediated rejection. So what will be the clue in antibody mediated rejection? In antibody mediated rejection, there'll be plenty of clues. There'll be capillaritis and more importantly, there'll be C4D staining will be positive. That's the clue. That's the catch in exam. The plenty of clues. But in exam, if they mention C4D positive, C4D staining is there. It almost always tells you it's antibody mediated rejection. So how are you going to treat acute cellular rejection? If they ask you the first treatment, whatever may be the case, the first treatment is going to be corticosteroids, high dose methylprednisolone. The moment you suspect acute rejection, you have to give IV methylprednisolone, high dose. One gram, we have to load it. It's the pulse dose. That's the first, first thing you have to do. Apart from that, after biopsy, you can continue. So initially, you suspect itself, you start with IV MPS. After that, if it's an acute cellular rejection, you can add antithymosic globulin. Generally, we add something called antithymosic globulin, ATG. If it's an antibody meter rejection, you can add IVIG, you can add IVIG, you can add plasma exchange, and you can add rituximab also, plus or minus rituximab also. Because rituximab, you know, it's an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. Where CD20 is present, it's present in the B cells. Who are B cells? They are the ones that are going to produce antibodies later on by differentiating to plasma cells. So add rituximab as an option entity. So you can add um, plus IVIG. IVIG is fine. Plus plasma exchange, plus rituximab. All of these things can be added because IVIG to sequester the antibodies, plasma exchange to remove those antibodies, and rituximab to suppress the B cells that are going to differentiate plasma cells to, that are going to produce antibodies. Obtaining donor sensitive antibodies should be done actually, but right now it's not that important because they're asking the best management, not like investigation. Obtain BK virus serum PCR. So this is not a case of like BK virus nephropathy. It completely presents in a different way. They're not going to present like this. So the right answer for this question is going to be option C. Start IVIG, corticosteroids, plasma exchange and rituxma, which is a treatment for antibody mediated rejection. Option D, start thymoglobulin and steroid will be a treatment for acute cellular rejection, not antibody mediated rejection. So generally you tend to get at least one question on transplant uh, nephrology. So be thorough about that. Another area that they may target in transplant nephrology is a CMP. So you know like very many of you would have mugged it up that the most common infection after transplant is cytomegalovirus infection. But with effective prophylaxis, we see very rarely nowadays. So all patients who are undergoing any solid organ transplant, post transplant, they're going to receive valcyclovir. So there is something called valcyclovir, isn't it? So when, if they're receiving valcyclovir, so there is no, I mean, that it's very difficult to get CMV infections. It's not possible. It's very unlikely. So prophylaxis is actually effectively has eliminated the dissemination of CMV in the current era. Right answer is C. Okay, next, moving on to the next question. A 15-year-old girl comes to the urologist for follow-up. Uh, she is visited after a UTI. She was diagnosed with bilateral grade 4 vesicoretal reflux at the age of 4 following frequent UTIs and an episode of pyelonephritis. The patient has been on antibiotic prophylaxis but has had several breakthrough UTIs. Her abdomen is soft and there is no tenderness on palpation. Her bl blood diuretic nitrogen is uh, 15 and creatinine is 1.5. Today, uh, MCU, that is micturating cysteurthogram or you can call it as VCR, widening cysteurthogram, shows a left-sided grade 3 vesicoretal reflex and right-sided grade 4 vesicoretal reflex. So both sides there is a significant VUR. So she is not having any residual post-wide contrast though. Which of the following is the next best step in management? So what is the right answer? Is it bilateral ureteric implant or continue antibiotic prophylaxis or repeat MC or DMS scan? So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Okay, so there's no need to do DMSA scan here because patient is having recurrent uh, UTIs despite adequate antibiotic prophylaxis. So you're going to do a bilateral ureteric reimplant. Okay, so surgery is the better option here. Surgery is the better option. There's no need because like when the, one of the main indications for surgery in a patient with grade 3, grade 4, not 1 or 2, grade 3, grade 4 vesicoretal reflex is going to be UTIs despite antibiotic prophylaxis. The patient is getting recurrent UTIs despite antibiotic prophylaxis. It's a major indication for surgery. So you know the grades of VUR. So you have grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4. In grade 1, grade 2, uh, you are going to observe predominantly. 
Okay, even with breakthrough duties, you can observe. It's not a problem. If it's just grade 1, grade 2. There you might consider DMAC scan to assess the renal scarring and all. But if it's grade 3, grade 4, it's very high grade. Grade 3, grade 4, grade 5. So you have to definitely consider ureteric re-implant. There are two important indications. Okay. For doing a uh, surgery. One is recurrent UTIs in a grade 3, grade 4 UPUR despite antibiotic prophylaxis. That's the number one most important indication. Recurrent UTIs despite grade 3, despite efficient antibiotic prophylaxis and having a grade 3, grade 4 and above VUR. Second indication is progression of kidney disease. If the kidney disease is progressing or the patient is highly symptomatic. Okay. So in that situation, you can go for VUR. I mean, we go for surgery. There are two important indications. This patient perfectly fits into surgery. So that's why, uh, I mean, treatment will be bilateral ureteric reimplantation. Continue antibody prophylaxis would have been the option if the patient has not got recurrent UT or if the patient probably had a grade 1 to VR, we can wait for some more time. DMSA again could have been an option in confusing cases. For example, if the patient is stable, not having UTI, but they are getting, but the creatinine is keeping on increasing. To find out what is the cause, you can look at renal scarring. For that, to look at the renal scarring, DMSA scan is very effective. For that, you can do. Repeat MCU, why you need it? Because already, even though the best investigation is micturating cysteurethogram or widening cysteurethogram, why you want to repeat an MCU in a patient who is already a known case of VUR? For diagnosis, it's fine. Why you want to repeat? Anyway, VUR patients unlikely to resolve. Okay, so that to grade 3, grade 4 and all. So there's no need to do MCU again. So right answer is bilateral ureteric reimplantation. What about this question? A 65-year-old man with a history of GPA, that is granulomatous with polyangitis, treated successfully with oral cyclophosphamide, presents with hematuria. He is asymptomatic and urine protein is 200 mg in 24 hours. What is the normal urine protein? Normal is less than 150 to 250. So, it depends. Less than 150 to 250 mg per day is the normal amount of protein in the urine. And has a stable creatinine of 1.4. And has a stable creatinine of 1.4. Oncotitis are unchanged from baseline. Okay, CT scan shows no kidney masses, cysts or stones. Which one of the following is the next best step in this patient? Kidney biopsy, follow-up treatment uh, with a UPT analysis and a 24-hour protein. Start corticosteroids and reassess in two weeks and start cystoscopy. Somebody is asking about uh, the importance of DMSA, DTP and MAC3. So it's very simple. So in exam, just remember these stuff. So what is your... Uh, primary priority that's what you need to know so if your idea is to assess the perfusion if your idea is to assess perfusion so you are going to do two scans either a DTPA scan or MAC3 both are okay DTPA MAC3 both are fine if your idea is to find out renal perfusion but MAC3 is relatively better if your problem is perfusion if you want to find out the morphology morphology means the kidney morphology and especially if there is any kidney scarring or not for the DMSA is better. Okay. So for example, morphology in the sense, if you want to look for cortical scarring, how much the cortex is scarred for that DMA is better. If you want to find out obstruction, obstructive uropathy, how much obstruction is there for that DTPA and MAC3 is better. Again, MAC3 and DTPA. How much obstruction? MAC3 and DTPA. This is better. And uh, if you have GFR quantification, if you want to find out GFR, then DTP is the best. DTP is the best for GFR. So for GFR, DTP, perfusion, predominantly MAC3, but DTP is also fine. Morphology, scarring means it's always DMSA. Obstruction, you can do with both MAC3 and DTP. There is something called relative function. In exam, they can ask something called relative function. This can be measured with all of the available traces. DMSA. DTPA and MAC3. Everything will give you the relative renal function, which means you can tell what percentage the kidneys are working. So to tell how much percentage the kidneys are working and all, um, you have to use some tracer. For that, any of these tracers can be used. So again, repeating perfusion, answer MAC3. Morphology, answer DMSA, especially for cortical scarring. GFR, answer DTPA. And for obstruction, MAC3 and DTPA, renal function, all of them can be useful. Okay. Coming to this one. So what is the answer for this? Many of you have answered C. Okay. Some of you have answered B. Some of you have answered D. The right answer for this question is cystoscopy. 
Okay, so that's the right answer. Because this is a very important point to know that this patient had a vaginous granulomatous and it has a prior history of exposure to cyclophosphamide. You know, there are plenty of toxins that can result in development of second cancer. There is something called second cancers and cyclophosphamide leads to one of the important second cancer called as bladder cancer. One of the important side effects of cyclophosphamide is future risk of development of bladder cancer. And that's why in any elderly patient with amateuria, you have to evaluate with cystoscopy for the bladder cancer. Why kidney biopsy is not required? The disease is quiescent. Look at the proteinuria. Proteinuria is fine. It's almost normal. Patient is having a stable creatinine of 1.4. Anka titers are also are unchanged. It's not changed. See, hemorrhagic cystitis is different. It's an acute complication. That we anyway avoid by giving something called mesna. Everyone knows that. It's because of a metabolic called as acrolein. You all know that. So that is a like outdated question. Nobody is going to ask that nowadays in the current era. But nevertheless, one important future complication of cyclophosphamide is bladder cancer. It's a very important risk factor. So you have to surely consider this as a possibility. Kidney biopsy is not required because the disease is stable. The patient is not having any flare-up of the disease. What are you going to do? achieve by doing kidney biopsy? Follow-up with the repeat urinalysis and 24 hour protein is not fine because already they have done like, uh, they would have done repeated tests and there is no need to do repeating. And it's not required. Starting cardiovascular and reassess in two weeks. Again, it's not required because we're not talking about vaginous granulomatous. We are talking about a malignant possibility. Cystoscopy. So remember, in exam, anyone who's elderly, age more than 40, plus if they're coming with amateuria, especially if it's a gross amateuria, you have to work up for bladder cancer. Cystoscopy is mandatory for most of these patients. This is very important. This is a very, very important clinical point, especially gross hematuria in an elderly individual like age more than 40. Cystoscopy is a must to rule out bladder cancer. And uh, what are the risk factors? Important risk factors of bladder cancer are going to be smoking. Okay, smoking is a very important risk factor. Number one, hist second history of cyclophosphamide exposure. Cyclophosphamide exposure in the past because of some cancer in the past, because cyclophosphamide is an alkylating agent that can result in multiple cancers, especially AML, MDS, but can also result in bladder cancer. Number three, you have to uh, look at uh, history of occupation, aniline dyes. Aniline dyes. I mean, I don't know, like many students nowadays are so fond of benzidine and benzene difference. I don't know how, because they have been asked in exams. Now, any student, if I ask like benzidine causes bladder cancer, benzene causes AML, that's because one neat question asked AML. Send it. That's why the, I was actually commenting on that. Pavitra told Benzidin. Okay. All right. Then fine. Cystosomiasis. Cystosomiasis. Okay. So cystosomiasis interestingly tends to cross squamous cell cancer of the bladder. And they be associated with bladder wall calcifications. Squamous cell cancer of the bladder and they are associated with bladder wall calcification. So these are the questions that you need to know for exams. Okay, so these are the risk factors for bladder cancer. This question is done and dusted. Let us move to the next one. Tenth question. A 34-year-old woman with SLE presence for evaluation and she has recent renal biopsy that showed membranous glomerular nephritis, which means it's a class 5 lupus nephritis. Class 5 lupus nephritis is basically a membranous form. Proteinuria was only uh, proteinuria only minimally improved and creatinine stabilized at 1.7. Creatinine stabilized at 1.7. Currently, her complaint is bilateral flank pain. Urinalysis shows crystals, 4 plus proteinuria and amateuria. Current creatinine is 3. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial therapy? So, patient present with SLE, membranous nephritis, proteinuria did not improve much. Creatinine previously was stable at 1.7. Now she is coming with bilateral flank pain. Urinalysis did not show any much crystals, but 4 plus proteinuria because already it was there, it, is, it didn't improve. And patient is having a new onset hematuria. Current creatinine is 3, which of the following is the most important and appropriate initial treatment. Is it cyclophosphamide or steparin? Is it IV pulse corticosteroids or it hydroxychloroquine? You know that hydroxychloroquine can be given in almost all the patients with SLE, but it doesn't have any role in treating acute illness. It only reduces the number of flares. In SLE, HCQ is only going to reduce the number of flares. It's given for almost all patients. Second, intravenous pulse steroids. No, it's not required because there is something else that you are like thinking over here. So if IV pulse steroids is not required, even cyclophosphamide will not be required. The right answer is going to be heparin. So why heparin? Because I am suspecting a bilateral renal vein thrombosis. That's what I'm suspecting. 
So what are the features of nephrotic syndrome? You all know that. So what are the features of nephrotic syndrome? Everyone knows, right? So number one, patients are going to have proteinuria. Second, patients are going to have hypoalbuminemia. Hypoalbuminemia. And third one is edema. And many times you tend to forget that patients also tend to have other features like hypercoagulability. Hypercoagulability, one of the main areas where they tend to develop thrombosis. They can develop anywhere, but don't forget renal vein thrombosis. And surprisingly, the risk of renal vein thrombosis is very, very high in patients with minimal, I mean, a membranous nephropathy. In membranous nephropathy, the risk of renal vein thrombosis is extremely high, extremely high risk. Okay, so that's why you typically have given membranous nephropathy as the clue. And how they will present, these patients with renal vein thrombosis are going to present with exactly what I mentioned, bilateral flank pain. Okay, it's a bilateral renal vein thrombosis causing bilateral congestion to the kidneys because of the congestion, high pressure, high pressure, stretching of the capsule and patients are going to have bilateral flank pain. Along with that, the patients will have new hematuria and this will not be glomerular hematuria, rather this will be uh, because of congestion and re resulting in exudation of RBCs in the urine. So, amateuria, flank pain and increase in creatinine, aka in a patient with nephrotic syndrome, always think about renal vein thrombosis. Flank pain, hematuria, high creatinine. A new aka in a patient with nephrotic syndrome always equates to renal vein thrombosis unless proved otherwise. Plus or minus, you know patient will have dyslipidemia or hyperlipidemia and patients will have lipiduria as well. These are other constellation of findings and that you see in patients with nephrotic syndrome. Proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, edema, hypercoagulability and lipid problems like dyslipidemia and lipiduria. And again, because it's been asked in exams, many students the moment I ask lipiduria, they will say fatty cast, they will say Maltese cross bodies and Poltrix microscope. I've heard so many times. And because Ames has asked once, they will say Maltese cross is seen in patients with Fabry's disease also. Please don't answer now because it's not required. Okay, so this is the answer for question number 10. The answer is heparin because it's a renal vein thrombosis. Any venous thrombus, I'm going to start with anticoagulation. So heparin will be the treatment of choice. If they ask you investigation of choice in this patient, I would have done a ultrasound of the renal veins. Ultrasound Doppler, renal vein Doppler. I would have done a renal vein Doppler. Early morning face swelling faster. That is, that is common in any nephrotic syndrome patient. That's a feature of kidney problem. Isomorphic RBs in microscope, yes. Isomorphic means it's ex extra glomerular. Dysmorphic means it's glomerular. But dysmorphic, that uh, morphology of RBCs is not that important. The RBC casts are going to be important. Because everyone knows that to diagnose glomerular bleed, you need at least 40% of the dysmorphic RBCs, 5% of acanthocytes. But just a single RBC cast can tell you it is glomerular injury. I'll repeat, 40% RBC cast, 5% acanthocytes, but just a single RBC cast can tell it's a glomerular injury. That's why RBC casts are more important than the dysmorphic RBCs. Of course, this is not a glomerular bleed, so patients can have isomorphic or non-dysmorphic RBCs. Not a problem. Madan Guti is answering loss of antithromine and plasminogen proteins. Yes, that's correct. That's a mechanism for hypercoagulability, but we are talking about clinical medicine. So only limited mechanisms is something that we need to know. So here is a case of RVT. In this case, investigation of choice will be renal vein Doppler, but the best investigation will be CT venogram. CT venogram, but the problem with CT venogram is it uses contrast. So I cannot do that if the patient's creatinine is 3. So that's why in this patient, I said renal vein Doppler is better, but overall best investigation is CT venogram, if provided if your creatinine is fine. So treatment of choice will be heparin. Okay, that's what I'm going to use. So that's why the answer for this question is option B. Coming to question number 11, you are reviewing a 33-year-old man who has a recent uh, uh, history of diagnosis of ADPKD, adult dominant uh, poly uh, polystic kidney disease. You proceed to examine his cardiovascular system. Which other feature you would most likely see on the examination, which you will see. Dilated cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis, renal bruise, secondary to renal artery stenosis and mitral valve prolapse, which means it's an ADPKD patient. What is the most common cardiac problem? That's what I'm asking. It's a simple question. It's a straightforward. It's like a one-liner question only. For this, I could have asked the most common cardiac problem in ADPKD. Answer is mitral valve prolapse. MVP is the most common problem. Most of the time, MVP will be asymptomatic. Even this is a question. It won't produce any symptoms at all. And it will be silent and patient will not be even aware of the mitral valve prolapse most of the times. 
So what about ADPKD? Important points. ADPKD, most of the times patients are going to have um, family history, a very strong family history. In fact, because this is a disease with extremely high penetrance, so family history is mandatory. And patients will present with um, either completely asymptomatic or in exams they can give. Patient can have abdominal mass. So this mass is basically a kidney. This mass is nothing but kidneys. If they give balatable mass, kidneys are balatable. So they can give with something called as balatable mass also. And along with that, patients can have um, hypertension. Hypertension is one of the most important complication, most common. In fact, the most common complication of uh, ADPKD is hypertension only. And most of the patients start developing hypertension in the 40s. 40s but it can occur in the 30s also but many patients start developing hypertension in the 40s and if they ask you treatment of choice for hypertension due to ADPKD answer is still ASNFDS or probably ARBs but in exam answer ASNFDS even in ADPKD this is the treatment of choice for hypertension first line treatment and patients can have complications due to the cysts cyst complications due to the cyst can occur so what are the complications that can occur because of ADPKD so number one Patients tend to have aneurysms, berry aneurysms, and this can break out and can lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage. And how many percentage of patients will have berry aneurysms? Around 5 percentage approximately tend to have berry aneurysms. And uh, number two, they can develop cyst-related complications. What are the cyst-related complications? Two important. One is called a cyst infection. Second is cyst hemorrhage. Both are very important. So the problem is, remember, we are talking about a cyst infection. So just do this is sufficient for nephro. How can I say man? What is sufficient? What is not sufficient? I feel like uh, these are the important areas to be covered. So I am covering it. But most likely enough. But it all depends on the examiners ultimately. But I feel like uh, this 20 topics if you cover. Probably if you go and study something else apart from that. To the, add on a little bit extra to this. Uh, that must be more than enough. Because these are topics that are more relevant and important. So infection. So what about infections? In infections, what will be the the problem is like many of the times the urine culture will be negative because remember we are talking about cyst infection and not urinary tract infection. If it's a UTI, maybe culture may be positive, but if it's a cyst infection, it's a localized infection, pocket of infection, it may not be visible. And patient will develop with fever, come with fever, elevated total leukocyte count, total WBC count will be high. Okay, so fever will be there, total WBC count will be high. And CRP, ESR will be high. So that's going to tell you that it's very likely to be. And patients will have flank pain. Flank pain because of the infection. So these are the important features of cyst infection. So what about the important features of cyst hemorrhage? These patients also will come with flank pain. But clue will be different. Patient will not have fever. Patient will not have fever. But rather patients will present with uh, low hemoglobin, low hematocrit. And if the hemorrhage is massive, they can have tachycardia okay that's how they're going to present no fever but they're going to have drop in hemoglobin hematocrit or tachycardia Rahul Sahu thank you so much and uh, wishing you all the very best because you have cleared the FMG exam with a very good score and my hearty congrats okay flank pain low hemoglobin low hematocrit and tachycardia okay these are going to be the classic features of cyst hemorrhage so cyst infection is very very difficult to treat only two antibiotics that is going to penetrate the kidneys as such only two antibiotics are going to penetrate the kidneys number one cotrimoxazole and number two fluoroquinolones number two fluoroquinolones these are the only two things that are going to penetrate cotrimoxazole fluoroquinolones that's it many of the drugs especially beta laxants have worst cyst penetration they don't penetrate the cyst at all so don't use cefaparazone, salbactam, don't use meropenem, piperazine, tazobactam. They don't have any cis penetration. You have to use these drugs only. They only have a good cis penetration. And if it's hemorrhage, just go for supportive management. Supportive. Support in the sense, just give PRBCs if the hemoglobin is too low. Or just treat supportively. Support the hemodynamics. That's it. So these are the complications that you need to know. And second, what they will ask is investigation of choice. Ultrasound. If they ask the investigation, best investigation, first investigation, Whatever it is, ultrasound is the number one. Number three, third, treatment. Treatment, if hypertension, you can give yes inhibitors. But most importantly, there are two drugs that have been shown to 
hemorrhagic cyst there will be both tachycard and hypertension i'm talking about hypotension tachycard and hypotension because it's bleeding the bp can fall down so treatment so what is the treatment treatment technically is going to be like giving some drugs that alter the natural course of the disease very rare until recently we don't know any drugs that alter the natural course of adpkd so two drugs have been approved is sirolimus and tolvaptan tolvaptan you know it's a aquaretic drug it's a v2 receptor blocker in the kidney sirolimus is basically a mtor inhibitor both drugs have been shown to improve outcomes they they have shown to reduce the progression of adpkd so how it works don't ask me it's a complicated mechanism it's based on the genetics so these are the important pointers with regards to adpkd the most common cardiac problem is mitral prolapse the most common site of extra renal disease extra renal cyst is liver liver is the second most common site of cyst but those liver cysts will be benign in adpkd those liver cysts will not cause any trouble that's a very important point liver cysts are benign in patients with adpkd coming to this one a 17 year old female undergoes uneventful arthroscopic knee surgery on his right knee because of ligament tear after playing football so this is an interesting case and this is actually a real case okay it it happened in tamil nadu i think you can go and uh, check out on the data i frame this case based on a real case scenario it become a huge case in tamil nadu it became headlines and uh, four doctors went to the verge of getting arrested because of the so much of ruckus that is created after this it's a real case okay so 17 year old female she is a athlete okay underwent football i mean she she is a football player this is a real case she is a football player she is an athlete and she had a acl tear and she went uh, arthroscopic knee surgery on, on her right knee so this my sorry for my english it's on her right knee uh, the surgery took a little longer than expected so that's a clue here the next day he has uh, she again sorry she has urine like coca cola the patient's current creatinine is 1.7 which means it's high the pre op creatinine was normal now it suddenly increased so it's a aka it's an acute kidney injury examination shows swollen tender right leg vitals are normal urine shows dark brown urine with trace protein 4 plus him 0 to 2 white blood cells 0 to 2 red blood cells which of the following is the most likely diagnosis is it glomerulonephritis glomerulonephritis after streptococcal infection or is it ig nephropathy or pigment induced nephropathy or acute obstruction by a kidney stone it's a very 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 straightforward case it's an easy one it's an extremely straightforward case i don't think uh, you need to think twice with regards to that so contrast where is the contrast man where the patient got a contrast i don't think the patient received contrast in the first place so this was a surgery done for acl tear why they want to use a contrast for acl tear many of you are correct it's actually pigment induced nephropathy so because this patient is suffering from rhabdomyolysis as simple as that rhabdomyolysis man so what are the clues for rhabdomyolysis in exam rhabdomyolysis is very very important what are the clues for rhabdomyolysis point number 1 patient will have some compatible history so what is going to be the compatible history there could be multiple reasons one they might give something called crush injury second they can give a history of electrocution or lightning strike injury this also an important evidence of rhabdomyolysis third uh, prolonged tourniquet this is a very important uh, situation okay this is often underestimated in india countries like india indian subcontinent prolonged tourniquet use so when you prolonged tourniquet use where you will see prolonged tourniquet use in snake bite in india very commonly you know that indians believe that if you tie tourniquet none of the toxin goes up and after that you can cut and suck all the toxin and either you drink or throw it up okay doesn't matter so prolonged tourniquet usually you see in the setting of snake bite or in arthroscopic surgeries in arthroscopic surgeries some because in arthroscopic surgeries they use some tourniquet like device uh, especially for knee surgeries above the knee to create a bloodless field everyone knows that and that's why i have given the surgery took a little longer than expected little longer than expected which means the muscle goes for ischemia because the surgery was little longer than expected there was a tourniquet to create a bloodless field and that 
created muscle ischemia and that's the reason for rhabdomyolysis and various drugs can cause rhabdomyolysis the most important is choline even though you can answer statins and all but statins are very rare okay they don't cause rhabdomyolysis that easily but this is a very important culprit choline can cause rhabdomyolysis and even sometimes your antipsychotic drugs producing neuroleptic malignant syndrome could be a culprit and status epilepticus is a very important cause status epilepticus so there are plenty of reasons for developing rhabdomyolysis okay first history is very important second look at the data look at the picture so what is the most important electrolyte disturbance hyperkalemia very very important because muscles are very rich in potassium that's why one of the first things that you have to do in hyperkalemic patient i mean in uh, rhabdomyolysis patients is take potassium and do an ecg because many times this hyperkalemia is acute so it can trigger arrhythmias and patients can die always do an ecg and try to uh, treat hyperkalemia asap as soon as possible hyperkalemia i'm not getting to know about the case okay just type uh, i don't know the name of the patient though one I, i don't know it's recent like two months ago or three months ago i'm not very sure when it happened uh, patient uh, was a athlete and uh, she developed rhabdomyolysis and she died because of that that was a huge problem that's created anyway i think somebody is from tamil nadu definitely they must be knowing it anyone from tamil nadu here definitely i think uh, this is something that was like very very famous yeah football girl died in chennai correct correct okay nevertheless let us move on so you are going to have hyperkalemia so you have to take ecg for almost all patients to prevent the development of ventricular tachycardia and death because of that and additionally patients can have hypocalcemia additionally patients can have hyperphosphatemia okay yeah so patients can have lot of problems but hyperkalemia is the most important okay that's more important and ldh levels can be high that's different but second important clue is cpk levels okay creatinine phosphate kinase levels this is the one that helps you diagnosis many times cpk levels can be in thousands or i mean not only thousands it's like 10000s or lakhs you don't believe i've seen a case like two weeks ago he got discharged i don't want to reveal his name though he said is my patient i have to maintain his confidentiality but you know his cpk levels normal cpk is less than 200 his cpk at the time of admission is 1.2 lakhs okay that's the cpk he had so usually in the setting of uh, rhabdomyolysis the creatinine phosphokinase tends to be very very high like like 10000 lakhs sometimes and usually in the setting of kidney injury they are going to have very high cpk like 30000 40000 it's very rare to have a like cpk of like like 3000 or 4000 something like that so cpk is very important plus or minus patients can have elevated ldh and they can have elevated ast mild ast but these are not important these are not important because these are also muscle enzymes or you can ask a specific enzyme it is aldolase b it is aldolase b so cpk okay is the most important that is the most important clue potassium high cpk high that's the clue third clue in exams it's a pigment isn't it rhabdomyolysis is going to release myoglobin it's not going to release any rbcs so in the urine what are going to see is myoglobin what are going to see is myoglobin and please understand okay you're going to see myoglobin please understand many times by the time patient presents the myoglobin in the urine have been disappeared and many times urine will be reddish okay you can have cola colored urine urine can be reddish it doesn't mean it's psgn why it is reddish because of the pigment because the myoglobin that is coming in the urine so that's why it's looking like as if it's hematuria and how will you differentiate it is myoglobin so directly you can do urine myoglobin that's fine but there are some indirect ways if the assay is not there indirectly you can pick up number 1 centrifuge the urine okay number 1 centrifuge the urine if you centrifuge the urine what are you going to see you will be seeing supernatant is red remember supernatant supernatant means top layer supernatant is red this is pigment that must be free hemoglobin or free myoglobin if the sediment bottom is red if the sediment is red they are rbcs very likely so in exam this could be the clue supernatant red after centrifuging it is pigment that's what you will see in myoglobinuria and hemoglobinuria second clue you will see dipstick dipstick will be strongly positive 3 plus or 4 plus dipstick will be strongly positive for heme because dipstick picks up heme not rbcs but in microscopy you will see no rbcs in microscopy you will see no rbcs 
okay or very normal like one to two or two to three so that much only not more than that so this discordance this discordance is very important so your dipstick is showing that as if so much of blood is there but microscope you're not seeing any rbc's at all because these are not rbc's the dipstick is picking up the heme that is present heme hemoglobin or myoglobin that's the clue so that's what is exactly happening here it is having four plus heme but absolutely no rbc's okay zero to rbc's so it's unlikely to be pigment induced nephropathy pigment induced nephropathy can be due to free hemoglobin or free myoglobin free hemoglobin occurs in intravascular hemolysis like g6 period deficiency or probably even malaria falciparum malaria severe falciparum malaria called as black water fever that's that's actually a pig, kind of pigment nephropathy only because the urine is red and reddish black because of massive hemolysis that falciparum malaria got that name okay black water fever that's basically nothing but a pigment released into the urine. So it could be free hemoglobin or free myoglobin. So here we are talking about rhabdomyolysis. That's why it's a pigment nephropathy. And if you want to confirm, gold strand is biopsy. In biopsy, you will see pigment cus. In biopsy, you see pigment cus. Thank you so much, Praveen, sir. Hope uh, students are not going to mind me like disturbing their Saturdays every time. So I think I'm disturbing the Saturdays every night. I mean, every every week I'm disturbing the Saturdays so that they are not able to be enjoying their Saturdays. So in biopsy, you're going to see pigment cus. Okay, that's what you're going to see. Which means in the tubules, you're going to see this pigment that will be deposited. Okay, deposited. It will be reddish pink in color. You can see that. Whether it's hemoglobin or myoglobin, it depends on a lot of other stains okay, that you use in pathology. Number five, treatment. So what's going to be the treatment? Treatment is going to be like conservative treatment only. So conservative in the sense you have to give IV fluids as much as possible. Maintain a very high urine output. Just flush it, flush out all the myoglobin out as, as much as possible. Just keep flushing the myoglobin. But once the patient develops oliguria, you have to go for renal replacement therapy. So once they develop oliguria, if they're not passing urine at all, how can you uh, keep giving more and more IV fluids? You cannot give more and more IV fluids. You have to go for renal replacement therapy only, dialysis in that setting. And another option that you can try is urinary alkalinization, which means you can give IV soda bicarbonate and you can maintain the urinary pH of more than 7 or 7.5. Urinary alkalinization, that is a very important concept. These and all will work only if the patient is not having oliguria. Once the urine is not coming and anyway, once the urine output is declining you you have to go for renal replacement therapy only there's no other option but understand renal replacement therapy cannot remove myoglobin renal replacement therapy cannot remove myoglobin myoglobin is a protein it's a large molecule so we are doing rrt dialysis not for removing myoglobin we are um, doing renal replacement therapy just for the sake of Complications, preventing complications or treating complications. That's what we do, renal replacement therapy. We are not going to do RRT for the sake of removing myoglobin because it's a protein, it cannot be removed. It's going to have large molecular weight. It's not possible. Okay, coming to question number 13, a 70 year old man with peripheral or severe peripheral arterial disease is admitted for chest pain undergoes coronary angiogram. His serum creatinine is unchanged for the last three days post procedure, but from day four, it slowly rises to a peak of 2.4 milligrams per deciliter. Urinalysis demonstrates no proteinuria or RBC cas and a few granular cas are present. Serum complement is low. Which one of the following is likely? Is it acute interstitial nephritis or chronic, sorry, contrast induced nephropathy or atheroembolic disease or PIG that is post infectious global nephritis? What is the answer for this question? Acute initial nephritis, chronic, I'm sorry, CN, contrast induced nephropathy, atheroembolic disease, and PHN, that is post infectious glomerular nephritis. What is the likely diagnosis here? So, let me tell you the right answer is atheroembolic disease. That's the right answer for this question. The reason why it is atheroembolic disease is because of the time, okay? The timing. The timing is going to be the most important. So, why the timing is, I mean, how to differentiate? Many times in exam, you get a history of coronary angiogram. You're going to get a history of coronary angiogram. And in the coronary angiogram, we're going to do two things. One, you will give IV contrast. Okay, you're going to give contrast, intraarterial contrast, not IV basically, intraarterial contrast. 
and second you are also going to catheterize arterial catheter you are going to introduce catheter this contrast component can cause contrast nephropathy and this catheter component because you are introducing catheter into the arteries and are going to the heart while going on the way you can break some of the atherosclerotic plaques and that can rupture and release a shower causing shower of emboli to the peripheral organs causing atheroembolic disease so both are possible okay atheroembolic disease granular cars are not uh, suggestive of anything basically if they give muddy brown granular cars then it can tell you it is uh, acute tubular necrosis but otherwise even grand it's going to tell you acute tubular necrosis only nothing more than that but just few granular cars nothing much you know you cannot think about anything so if they clearly say muddy brown cars then it goes towards acute tubular necrosis so now two possibilities are there either contrast nephropathy or it could be an atheroembolic disease but how do you differentiate look at the timing so there are two things contrast nephropathy and atheroembolic disease atheroembolic disease so look at the timing so contrast nephropathy is going to occur in the first day day one or two okay within 24 to 48 hours you will see rise in serum creatinine but in atheroembolic disease it's going to be a little delayed usually after day four to day seven it will be delayed day four to day seven so the rise in serum creatinine will occur only after a few days it won't occur immediately contrast nephropathy patients will be completely asymptomatic they're going to be totally asymptomatic in fact they'll be non-oliguric also only creatinine rise you will expect in atheroembolic disease patient will be usually having some symptoms either they can have non-specific symptoms constitutional symptoms like mild fever arthralgia that's because of complement consumption second they can have some embolic symptoms what are the embolic symptoms they can develop amaurosis fugax amaurosis fugax transient loss of vision because of the uh, shower of emboli to the retinal arterioles cause i mean these plaques can be seen in the fundoscopy called as holland hust plaques everyone would have studied in ophthalmology or alternatively they can get blue cyanotic toes blue cyanotic toes and that is because of the embolic shower to the distal parts of the feet these are small capillaries where they can occluded they can get blocked okay so what about the complement complement levels will be normal in contrast nephropathy complement levels will be low because of complement consumption in fact low i mean complement consumption is the reason for the non non specific symptoms that you see in patients with other embolic disease low c3 is very very common so these are the differences between these two so that's the reason there's a clear clue that uh, till three days post procedure is creatinine was unchanged which means it's unlikely to be a contrast news nephropathy and after that is creatinine went up to 2.4 so from day four only so it's a late rise so this delayed presentation is very much suggestive of other embolic disease and granular cars are not specific basically if it's just few it's muddy brown cars i can talk about 18 but nevertheless this is what i'm trying to say is this is basically a proper kidney problem it's damaging the kidneys Okay, if it's contrast news nephropathy, you won't see any cast. Okay, it will be just bland urine, nothing more than that. You don't see cast. The presence of cast tells you it is not um, anything else apart from atheroembolic disease. If it's acute initial nephritis, there will be some history like drug use or infection, something like that. It's not there here and urine will show WBC cast. That is not the case here. You know why it is not contrast nephropathy? If it's PAGN, you will see again RBC cast because it's a glomerular nephritis. So the right answer just out of exclusion is going to be other embolic disease treatment is just conservative for both so 59 year old man has mi complicated by shock he recovers well from mi but several days later his renal function deteriorates one week after his mi is oliguric and bun creatinine are 53 and 3.9 respectively urinalysis shows multiple granular cars which of the following which uh, when measuring the phena what is the likely value of phena so you know the diagnosis why likely value of phena Neeraj Mishra is asking why not acute natural nephritis. You, there is no compatible history number one with acute natural nephritis. Second, urine will show WBC cast in acute natural nephritis and there should be evidence of urine eosinophils or eosinophilia or rash. You don't have any clinical picture that is compatible with the diagnosis of acute natural nephritis. So what is the diagnosis? What is the answer for this? What is the phena over here? So what is suspecting first of all and what is the phena? So technically, to answer this, you need to know the differences between a pre-renal AKI and an intrinsic renal AKI that is acute tubular necrosis. You need to know the difference between them. Pre-renal AKI, I told you already so many times, you can look at any of my previous lectures. Okay, You can see that in pre-renal AKI, it's due to hyperperfusion. The specific gravity will be more than or equal to 1.0 to 0. 
okay specific gravity will be more than 1.020 where it here it will be less than 1.010 the urine osmolality will be more than 500 over here urine osmolality will be less than 350 generally in acute tubular necrosis but it could be in between also the urinary sodium will be less than 20 here it will be more than 40 the fractional excretion of sodium will be less than one percentage here it will be more than two percentage but anything more than one percentage is significant the fractional excretion of urea will be less than 35 percentage here in 18 it will be more than 35 percentage and something called urine creatinine to plasma creatinine ratio is there okay that will be less than 20 here urine creatinine to plasma no no urine creatinine to plasma creatinine will be more than 40 in a prenatal AK whereas urine creatinine to plasma creatinine ratio will be less than 20 or less than 10 in the setting of acute tubular necrosis then we have something called bun creatinine ratio it will be more than 20 in prenatal AK bun creatinine ratio will be less than 15 in case of acute tubular necrosis so you know very well that these are going to be the picture okay of prenatal versus ATN the basis of all these things we have discussed in plenty of our previous lectures no need to bother but here the clue is the bun creatinine ratio so what is the bun creatinine ratio bun creatinine ratio is 53 by 3.9 so here the bun is 53 creatinine is 3.9 which means it is definitely less than 15 bun creatinine ratio that falls under acute tubular necrosis so what is the likely phena that you are going to see it's going to be more than two percentage so because we are dealing with the case of acute tubular necrosis here you won't see granular cast or muddy brown cast in the setting of prerenal AK so in prerenal AK the sediment will be bland the urinary sediment will be bland what do you mean by sediment is bland there is no much finding in the urine but in setting of acute tubular necrosis you will see granular muddy brown cast granular muddy brown cast that's what i'm going to see in the case of acute tubular necrosis so here clearly the presence of granular cast also is indicative of atn only so in atn definitely you are going to see a phenom of more than two percentage so 35 percentage is basically for uh, urea that's a cutoff not for phenom Less than one will be seen in patients with prerenal AK, not with acute tubular necrosis. The right answer for this is option A. Pretty much simple question. A 30 year old female presents to the emergency room with epistaxis. On examination, she has a low grade fever and appears confused and jaundiced. UPT is negative. Blood results from laboratory shows uh, hemoglobin of 8.5. She is having anemia. Platelet is 8000, which means the patient is having severe thrombocytopenia. WBC is 4500 okay that's correct that's okay WBC is fine MCV is 92 which means he's having a normocytic anemia sodium is 138 potassium is 4.9 millimoles per liter urea is 102 milligrams per deciliter urea is high creatinine is 3.21 so she's having AK also clotting studies are normal what is the most appropriate treatment or the most appropriate treatment that's what I think first you have to make a diagnosis so this patient is having a normocytic anemia. Normocytic anemia. This is an integration of so many things, right? So this patient is having a normocytic anemia. So what is the most important cause of normocytic anemia? So don't say a plastic anemia. A plastic anemia tends to have normocytic or um, macrocytic anemia. That doesn't matter. But this is a very acute presentation. Okay, he is presenting with epistaxis. Okay, patient is confused. Patient is jaundiced. Okay, that clue tells you. So, what are the two important causes? Aplastic anemia and hemolytic anemia. So, patient is having hemolytic anemia. Okay, hemolytic anemia. So, what are the clues in this question? Patient is having normocytic anemia and patient is having jaundice. Okay, that tells you that the patient is having hemolytic anemia. Dr. Sri Aruna Krishnan is asking, uh, is it okay to watch this series rather than a six year revision? That is a YouTube cerebellum. See, both has to be watched. That's very important. So, see, I've given a lot of information there also in a concise way. I'm giving a lot of information here also. I would say, like, it's better that you watch both. See, honestly, how much I'm going to discuss? I'm going to discuss probably uh, around uh, 20 hours on questions, like 20 to 22 hours. Plus, I will have, like, maybe 6 to 7 hours. So, I think, like, I've given almost everything in that 25 to 30 hours of medicine right so i'm trying to tell as many things as possible so i think even if you spend like four to five hours a day you will be able to complete all these lectures completely within a span of like five days so that five days in the same day itself you can revise and that's going to be more than enough as far as i know i don't think it's like 
going to be a waste at all. So don't think of anything else. Just read the 25 to 30 hours and just go on. Okay, you will be all right. And most of the questions you will be answering it right. Because I am covering almost all the important areas. So don't worry. So normocytic anemia. So you are going to have hemolytic anemia. Okay. Apart from that, uh, patient is having thrombocytopenia. And patient is having AK, acute kidney injury. And patient is having confusion. Okay, confusion. So this points towards TTP. Thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Membrane. That's correct because most of the TTPs tend to occur in late pregnancy. Okay. And especially in the younger women. Especially during pregnancy in fact. So pregnancy is very very common. Especially in the third trimester pregnancy. So this confusion tells you it is very likely to be a thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura. If it's going to be TTP then PEX will be the right answer. So that's what you need to do. Steroids are not helpful here. IVIG can be tried but it's not going to be that helpful. Platelet transfusions are in fact contraindicated in patients with uh, HUS and TTP complex. So you cannot okay, try that. So in exam, how will you find out whether it is uh, HOS or TTP? Just see the triad, okay? So all HOS and TTP will have a characteristic triad called as TMA triad. This is called thrombotic microangiopathy triad. So what are the features of TMA triad? Patient is going to have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So what are the clues for microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? Patient will have evidence of hemolysis. Okay, what are the evidence of hemolysis? Patient will have jaundice. Okay, or in increased indirect bilirubin. Patient will have increased indirect bilirubin. Second, patients will be having uh, increased LDH. Okay, that's a very important sign of hemolysis. And patient will have normal MCV. It's usually a normocytic anemia. Most often, if it's isolated hemolysis, it will be a normocytic anemia only. LDH high, indirect bilirubin high, MCV will be normal. Plus, to say it's a microangiopathic, patient should have cystocytes. Cystocytes in the peripheral smear. This is very important. These are fragmented RBCs. Why you see RBC fragmentation? Because of the fact that it's a microangiopathic. These RBCs have to pass through small, small clots and small, small spaces. So that's why it's a microangiopathic. The RBC will be fragmented, disrupted. Decreased aptoglobulin will be seen usually in intravascular hemolysis. You won't see that in extravascular hemolysis. Okay, that's not a problem here. Anyway, we are talking about clinical practice. Aptoglobulin is not very commonly done. And the second is thrombocytopenia. Third one is end organ injury. Second is thrombocytopenia and third one is going to be end organ injury. This end organ injury could be anything. It could be kidney, it could be liver or it could be something else. But in this setting, always look at D-dimer first. D-dimer and FDP. This is very, very important. And see PT, APTT, INR. PT, INR and partial thromboplastin time. PT, INR and partial thromboplastin time. Look at this. Remember, if all these are increased, always think about DIC. Always you have to ask yourself the question. It's likely to be a DIC, that is disseminate intravascular coagulation. It's very, very important, differential. Because DIC also can present with the same finding, okay, like HUSTTP. Many times, I mean, when it happens is because students will be very good in pathology. Students will be studying so many things, MCQs, and come back to the clinical practice. And once they see a case in the ICU, they see patient is having high creatinine, patient will be having evidence of hemolysis with high LDH and all, patient will be having anemia, patient will be having thrombocytopenia, they will immediately jump to a conclusion, sir, sir, this is HUS, this is TTP. No. Many times, patient will have sepsis and that could be DIC. So that's why you have to look at the D-dimer, FDP, PT, INR. So if the patient is having all these normal, then probably, then only probably are going to think about HUS, TTP complex. Even this has plenty of other differential diagnosis. Okay, you are possibly thinking about a HOS TTP complex here. So how, how HOS presents? HOS has a typical triad. They are going to have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. They are going to have thrombocytopenia. More importantly, they will have AK. AK is the dominant picture okay, in patients with uh, HOS and T HOS, hemolytic uremic syndrome. But in TTP patients, they will have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. They will have thrombocytopenia. And they will have acute kidney injury also. But the most important feature here is neurological involvement. This neurological involvement is the most important. They can have confusion, seizures and all. Plus or minus they can have acute kidney injury and plus or minus they can have fever also. So look at our patient. Our patient is having the classic pentad of PTD, TTP. Patient is having fever. Patient is having confusion. Patient is having thrombocytopenia, AKI and patient is having hemolytic anemia as well. So this is very likely to be a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura only. You know what is the reason for TTP? So, HOS typically occurs in children due to shijatoxin 
but there are some complementary HAs also. I'm not going to talk about that right now. It's not a topic of now. Shija toxin. Shija toxin can be produced by um, your Shija toxin producing E. coli. Two strains are there O157H7, and another strain is O104H4. But the most common strain is O157H7. Okay, o 157 h that's the most common strain, that's a E. coli. This strain of E. coli is also called as enterohemorrhagic E. coli. That's very important. It's not enterotoxigenic, it's basically an enterohemorrhagic E. coli, STEC. Even though it's produced toxin, it's hemorrhagic E. coli. That's the reason. And patients will have history of bloody diarrhea. Most of them will have history of bloody diarrhea. And they will come with, okay, and most of them will be children, very young children, like two years, three years. That's how they present. What is the treatment? Treatment is conservative. Treatment is conservative treatment only. The most important two things that you need to know is no antibiotics, no platelets. Very important, no platelet. Unless and until there is severe bleeding, don't transfuse platelets for mild bleeding. No platelet and no bleeding. So platelets are actually contraindicated in HOSTTP. In DDC, DIC you can give no problem, but in HOSTTP, no platelets, no antibiotics. This will only worsen the situation. Don't do that. You know what is the reason for TTP? TTP is basically due to Adams 13 deficiency. Adams 13, it's a protease. So it, uh, it's going to cleave the Van Lebrand factor multimers. If the Van Lebrand factor multimers are not cleaved, um, they're going to stick to the endothelium and they're going to activate platelets and that will form small, small clots and that will result in microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and organ ischemia. That's the problem. So what will it do? Yeah, the treatment of choice is PEX, plasma exchange. Plasma exchange is the treatment of choice. In exam, whenever there is severe neurological injury, always think about TTP rather than HOS. So TTP typically tends to occur in late third trimester, where the most closest to differential diagnosis is health syndrome. I'll repeat, TTP tends to occur in the late third trimester of pregnancy also, but the most closest to differential for TTP is health syndrome. So what will be the clue in exam? In exam, Patients will have a history of hypertension, preeclampsia, that's a big clue. If that is the case and even if the patient presents with the same triad of TTP, you tend to diagnose HELP syndrome only. Because HELP syndrome also is going to cause anemia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. HELP syndrome also can cause thrombocytopenia and HELP syndrome also can cause organ injury. Mostly they will cause hepatitis, elevation of uh, liver enzymes. That's why it's called HELP, hemolysis, low platelet, liver elevation of liver enzymes. Okay, so they can have organ injury. So the same... TMA triad can be there in health syndrome also. That's why you should be careful. So look at the clinical features properly. Okay, help will have history of hypertension, proteinuria and all. Along with that, they will usually not have fever. But they can have neurological involvement, AK and all, because it's preeclampsia related. Okay, so be careful in exam. Closest DD is health syndrome, especially if they come with late third trimester of pregnancy. And it's very common in young females, TTP. So right answer for this is PECS because we're talking about um, a thrombotic thrombocytic purpura. So this six question, interesting question. This is asked, I think, two to three times in INACT. That's why I have given this question. French in catheter means what? It means inner radius or it means outer diameter or it means inner circumference or it means outer circumference. So what French means, okay, in practice. So Dr. Avinash is answering option A. I know what other students are going to answer. Some people are answering option B. Some people are answering option D. Some people. Okay. So let us clarify. Okay. This one. Let us see. I mean, how there is something called pi. Okay. So whenever I talk about French, I used to look at something called pi. So the number pi. So you know, number pi is very special 22 by 7. And now, if you approximate, it's 3.14, but it keeps going. So how do you get the pi? How you get pi? How do you get pi, basically? What are the mathematics behind pi? Actually, I like geometry, and I'm a big fan of mathematics. Unfortunately, I ended up with uh, medicine. But nevertheless, what is the basis of pi? So take a circle. Take any circle for that matters. Okay, you're going to take the circumference. So what is circumference? This is the circumference. This is the circumference, C. And this is the diameter, D. However, maybe the size of the circle, it doesn't matter. 
okay however maybe the size of the circle it doesn't matter it could be the size of the moon it could be the size of the sun it could be the size of this watch dial it doesn't matter however maybe the circle size it doesn't matter if you take the circumference and divide it with the diameter you're going to get pi that's it this is going to be applicable for everything in the world and in the universe take circumference divide it by d you get pi that's it as simple as that c by d is pi this is the concept okay so circumference is equal to pi d okay which means you can approximate that circumference is equal to 3 times the diameter generally 3.14 times the diameter but 3 times the diameter yes that c by d fraction remains the same irrespective of the size of the object that's how pi came into existence pi is not someone i mean we didn't discover pi accidentally like 22 by 7 is the number or 3.14 is the number we know that the circumference of any circle divided by diameter is equal to the value of something called pi 22 by 7 that's always the same for any circle in the universe so approximate so 3 so we medicos are always known for approximation isn't it we don't write 3.14 times the d rather we can write 3 times the d so it is the outer circumference okay of a circle and then outer diameter of a circle right outer diameter of the circle outer circumference means you are using the outer diameter so c by 3 is equal to d right circumference by 3 is equal to d so what we did is we replaced that okay circumference with french value okay french value is equal to 3d so if you want to know the outer diameter french divided by 3 that's it now we can understand so what does it mean it means outer circumference that's it okay do you understand that French in cathedral means outer circumference. Okay, that's what we use. Water may be the cathedral size. If you divide that French size by 3, you are going to get the outer diameter. So, French literally means outer circumference. Hi, Priyatosh. You are going to get outer circumference. So, which is used to get the outer diameter. It is used to get the outer diameter. Okay. So, what they are literally asking is French means what? It is outer circumference. It is used to get the measure the outer diameter. Okay. Of any instrument. So, why this is important? Why this is important? Because in any surgical instrument you need to know what is the size how will you know the size you need to have a standard like number so how much bigger hole you want to insert that is something you need to know that's why you use the french value it was discovered by one person called french that's why his company name is french so that's how it came it is based on the size of the surgical instruments Okay, so it means outer circumference. Okay, now we can understand like what is the concept of not only the concept of French, you can also understand the concept of pi and how it is related to circle. Yeah, you need the outer diameter. So French by 3 will be the outer diameter. So whatever is the French number, you divide it by 3, you get the outer diameter approximately. So coming to the nephrology question number 17, uh, it's based on UTI. A 76 year old woman is brought to the emergency after getting discharged from recent hospitalization because of the right flank and abdominal pain for the past 24 hours. She also has fever and nausea, right? Uh, she has a diabetes on metformin. Her temperature is 38.8 degree Fahrenheit. I mean Celsius, it's 101.8 degree Fahrenheit. And pulse rate is 92, respiratory rate is 14, CBG is 127, BP is 130 upon 82 millimeters of mercury uh, urinalysis shows uh, 40 to 50 cells per hyperfill. What is the cells? These are basically WBCs. Sorry for that. I think it's missing that WBC is 40 to 50 per hyperfill. Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment for this patient? So what are we going to start with? What are we going to start with? Let me see your comments. So this patient is having a UTI. There's no doubt about that. But what kind of UTI this patient is having.
what kind of UTI the patient is having. What is the UTI? So what is the syndrome, clinical syndrome? So remember clinically, UTI can be, it's diagnosed clinically. It's not uh, a diagnosis of imaging or it's not diagnosis of, many people think like the pyelonephritis, the cystitis, the urethritis, they tend to diagnose based on uh, imaging. See, emphysematous pyelonephritis is imaging diagnosis. Xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis is a pathological diagnosis. That all is fine, that's different. But the clinical diagnosis of cystitis, urethritis, prostatitis, pyelonephritis is all going to be a, like based on clinical picture. For example, if the patient is presenting only with LUTS, that is lower urinary tract symptoms, only LUTS, what are the LUTS you will have? Suprapubic pain, okay, suprapubic pain and the patient is having hematuria, hematuria and if the patient is having um, urinary frequency and urgency, dysuria, okay, dysuria, frequent urination and urgency. Remember, if you don't have fever, if you don't have fever, no flank pain. No flank pain. This syndrome is called as cystitis. This syndrome is called as cystitis or otherwise called as uncomplicated urinary tract infection. Okay, uncomplicated urinary tract infection. That's just a cystitis, very common in young women. So nothing, just coming with LUTS, lower urinary tract symptoms, nothing more than that. Second syndrome. So if the patient is also having flank pain, okay, flank pain, if the patient is also having fever, if the patient is having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, this syndrome is what we call as pyelonephritis. This syndrome is called as pyelonephritis. This is a clinical diagnosis again. Third, if the patient is having urethral discharge predominantly, dysuria and urethral discharge. Urethral discharge. This is urethritis. This is STA, sexually transmitted infection. This is urethritis. This is a different syndrome. Okay, that we make. That's why you have syndromic management. I mean, I'm not going to talk about it right now because it's ID, total ID and uh, Maybe dermatologists may teach you, microbiologists can teach you, but I don't know properly. It's a, in fact, this is topic anyways. So it's urethritis. Okay. Number four. If the patient is having symptoms of hesitancy, weak stream and all. Suppose the patient is having lower urinary tract symptoms. Along with that, LUTS. Along with it, the patient is having uh, like symptoms of obstruction, like urinary hesitancy. They are trying to pass the urine, but they are not able to pass. They are struggling in the bathroom along with weak stream. You suspect prostatitis, especially elderly men, like 50 plus. So what are the other clues? Plus or minus patients can have perineal pain. You have to immediately check the perineum. Patient can have perineal pain. And patients can have fever. And patients can have tenderness on prostate. Digital rectal examination will be painful. Painful DRE. This is a very important clue. Painful DRE, painful digital rectal examination. So this is suggestive of prostatitis, prostatitis, clinical diagnosis. So remember, you cannot diagnose prostatitis without a DRE. So easy to diagnose in practice. I've diagnosed plenty of prostatitis. In every month, I diagnose at least three to four prostatitis. So simple to diagnose. You need not do any imaging. See, I have not talked about urine culture. I have not talked about imaging. I have not talked about investigations, WBC count, urine culture, urine routine, nothing, just clinical, just clinical, that's all. Only LUTS symptoms, young woman, I symptom, I mean, no other fever, no flank pain, it's uncomplicated cystitis. If you have flank pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, think about pyelonephritis, dysuria and urethral discharge, think about urethritis. Pain is having hesitancy, weak stream, especially elderly men with perineal pain, pain on digital rectal examination, it's going to be prostatitis, that's it. Okay. Apart from that, if it's a in pyelonephritis, if they mention plus persistent fever, you are having a pyelonephritis patient, but persistent fever and not responding to antibiotics, not responding to antibiotics, persistent fever, not responding to antibiotics. What do you think? Persistent fever, not responding to antibiotics. 
in this case you have to suspect renal abscess i repeat in this case you have to suspect renal abscess honestly speaking we have seen plenty of renal abscess patients plenty 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 of renal abscess patients many times we give treatment for uti it doesn't work out we we might be even getting an organism in the culture we treat that but patient will still develop fever and they won't respond to antibiotics immediately do an imaging especially a contrast ct if the creatinine is normal you can see a renal abscess if you drain that abscess patient's fever will settle down that's it that's a very important point okay so these are the clinical syndromes that we look for whether it's cystitis or urethritis or prostatitis or pyelonephritis or renal abscess what are you looking at okay so again you're going to treat based on clinical picture only they will ask you how to treat cystitis if it's uncomplicated just cystitis just use like common routine antibiotics most of the time so you give nitrofurantoin nitrofurantoin yes stones will fit it's a clinical syndrome man stones will fit yes percutaneous aspiration for renal abscess can be done no problem so nitrofurantoin what is the dose will give common dose is 100 mg bid for 3 to 5 days that's the usual dose or alternately you can use cotrimoxazole okay tmp smx this is also very good drug okay bactrim ds two times a day for three days okay tmp smx or alternatively there is a new drug this could be asked in exam okay there is something called phosphomycin okay this is something i use very very commonly nowadays phosphomycin all we need is just give a three gram single dose stat dose that's it this is something that i use very commonly in patients who i feel like they won't be taking the drugs properly just give a single dose phosphomycin it comes in sachet mix in what to drink it in the empty stomach your uti is done so this is approved for single dose regimen phosphomycin okay that could be asked in exam see fluoroquinolones we don't use right now in community acquired setting especially in indian patients because of the high levels of fluoroquinolone resistance because majority of the uti is right now are resistant to fluoroquinolone very rarely we see uh, especially klebsiella species fine to some extent they are responding to fluoroquinolones Phosphomycin is costly. Yes, it's four hundred and ninety rupees. There are a lot of brands. Two brands are available. If you want to know, one is called as Novifos. Second one is called as Fosirol. So any one of these brands you can give, but both are costly, like four hundred plus. But nevertheless, that's an advantage is single dose. Okay. So this is what you're going to try. Okay. So what you're going to do if it's going to be a pyelonephritis? What you're going to do if it's a pyelonephritis? If it's a pyelonephritis, uh, you have to use. Uh, um some drug so like for example typically we can use ceftriaxone no problem so even ceftriaxone is fine but ideally you have to give for 14 days i can write ceftriaxone for 14 days is fine for pyelonephritis but any pyelonephritis you have to treat for 14 days at least but this is not enough if the patient has risk factors risk factors for mdr if the patient is having risk factors for multi drug resistant organisms so who are the ones who are going to have risk factors for mdr especially those patients who are hospitalized recently that's a very important point those patients who are immunosuppressed those patients who are hospitalized more likely to develop mdr organism those patients who are having diabetes mellitus okay those patients who are having structural kidney disease okay in those people there is definite risk factor for mdr especially those patients who are recently hospitalized very high risk of developing mdr so in these patients what you have to do you have to cover for pseudomonas aeruginosa So the first line drug in these patients will be drugs that cover pseudomonas, like you are going to give meropenem or imipenem, okay, any one, or you can use piperazolin tazobactam, piptazo, or you can use a uh, fourth generation keflosporin called as kefipim, or sometimes keftazidim also. But for urinary tract infection purpose and all, we use kefipim commonly. Okay, this is what you have to try. Any one of these drugs is what you have to give if it's going to be a complicated. UTI, especially with risk factors for MDR organisms. So, what are the risk factors? The most important risk factor for MDR is recent hospitalization or instrumentation, like you have done cystoscopy, something like that. Recent hospitalization or instrumentation of the urinary tract, like cystoscopy, or alternatively, if the patient has been re received antibiotics, received antibiotics recently, received antibiotics in the last. uh maybe few weeks of few months so these are the usual risk factors apart from that immunosuppression immunosuppressed individuals like hiv patients or post transplant individuals bone marrow transplant individual these patients are at very high risk or uh, patients who are having diabetes mellitus these patients are also at high risk 
So these are the usual reasons for MDR. If there is a reason for MDR, you have to cover Pseudomonas aeruginosa also. That is the reason why I am going to add uh, this thing. Suppose if the patient is in shock, if risk factors for MDR is there, plus if the patient is in shock, add vancomycin also. Add vancomycin as well. That's very important because you have to cover some enterococcal species also. Add vancomycin. Okay, add vancomycin. If specifically they have given vancomycin resistant enterococcus, go for TG cycling exam. Specifically, if they are mentioned, they won't do that usually, but if they are mentioned it's a vancomycin resistant enterococcus causing UTI, the right choice is TG cycling. Linozolid is not a very good choice here. Alternative is linozolid. You can use if you want, but that doesn't have a good urinary penetration. But you can use. Quinolones, better avoid in Indian population. It's very, very um, rare to see a quinolone sensitivity. Quinolones are going to be generally resistant organisms. You can see very clearly, okay? So this is what is going to occur. So UTIs, I mean urethritis, you are going to see syndromic approach. I am not going to talk about it right now, but that's a, that's a complete ID approach. You have something called syndromic approach that you have separate kits for that. You have to think in a different way. And prostatitis. How are you going to treat prostatitis? There, remember, prostatic penetration is again going to be very poor by many drugs. Use either fluoroquinolones or cotrimoxone. Like I told you, you know, for ADPKD, only two drugs penetrate the cyst. Likewise, fluoroquinolones and cotrimoxone only will penetrate the prostate better. No other drug. Beta lactams are very poor in prostatic penetration. Okay, they don't penetrate the prostate very nicely. So any one of these drugs you're going to use. These have good prostatic penetration. So but prostatitis treatment will be like uh, for prolonged duration. So acute prostatitis you can give for like maybe up to like 14 to 28 days, two to four weeks. For chronic prostatitis, you have to give for a very long period, like six to 12 weeks of treatment. So generally prostatitis will not um, get cured that easily. You need a long-term treatment for prostatitis, like two to four weeks for acute and chronic six to 12 weeks. So this is an entire approach for your UTI. This is very important. Uh, it's a clinical approach, completely in fact a clinical approach. So what is this patient having? I mean, you're going to tell what is the syndrome that this patient is fitting into. This patient was discharged from recent hospitalization. Patient has been having right flank and abdominal pain for the last 48 hours. She also has fever and nausea. So what clinical syndrome that this patient is fitting into? Okay, recent, I mean, right flank pain, abdominal pain, along with fever and nausea. So what clinical syndrome that this patient is fitting into? This patient is fitting into something called as pyelonephritis. This patient is fitting into pyelonephritis. Correct? So this patient is having risk factors for MDR or not risk factors for MDR? This patient is having risk factors for MDR or not risk factors? Yes, this factor, this patient is having a high risk uh, for a MDR pyelonephritis. So it's better that you choose meropenem. Septraxone would have been an alternative choice if the patient doesn't have risk factors, but this patient clearly has a risk factor, so it's a MDR pylo likely. So you have to start with meropenem. The patient's BP is 130-80, so 130-82, so there's no need of vancomycin in this case. I don't think there is any need for vancomycin as far as this case is concerned. It's not required. Cool. So right answer for this is option A. Coming to question 18, these are easy questions. Which of the following is the most likely mechanism of gentamicin related acute kidney injury? So generally, and this is the, uh, gentamicin is an aminoglycoside, right? Gentamicin is an aminoglycoside. So you have four options, acute intestinal nephritis, acute tubular ne necrosis, glomerular nephritis, and ischemic injury. Gentamicin doesn't cause ischemia. Agents like contrast-induced nephropathy can have some ischemic background, but gentamicin doesn't. Glomerular nephritis, no. NS, uh, I mean, amnoglycoside don't cause glomerular nephritis. NSAIDs can cause glomerular, glomerular injury in the form of minimal chain disease and all. Bisphosphonates can cause deep enzyme can cause, there are plenty of drugs that can cause glomerular injury, but definitely not gentamicin. Gentamicin, I didn't tell you, you know, like I told antibiotics means penicillin, sulfur, beta lactams and sulfur drugs can cause acute nephritis, but not aminoglycosides. They generally tend to cause injury by acute tubular necrosis. And many times gentamicin related, Injury will start after 3 to 4 days. Again, it will be usually late only, 3 to 5 days. It doesn't occur in the first 3 days, usually. Very commonly, it will occur after 5 days. And many patients will be non-oliguric. Only way to pick up will be elevated creatinine or elevated creatinine. So that's how they present. Little later, but after 3 to 5 days, not immediately. 
and whether they can develop aka after discontinuation of aminoglycosides or not that's also a question are they going to develop after discontinuation of gentamicin can they develop aka after discontinuation of gentamicin or any aminoglycoside can they develop aka answer is an absolute yes why because gentamicin tends to get concentrated in the renal cortex i'll repeat gentamicin will be or any aminoglycoside will be concentrated in the renal cortex so even if you have stopped aminoglycoside it's possible that you can get a kidney injury because it would have concentrated in the renal cortex that's the reason so that's a very important question in fact that point is highlighted in harrison they mentioned that patients can develop renal injury and patients can develop acute kidney injury even after stopping the aminoglycoside so don't think you're smart like you're going to give only for you know that after three to five days you're going to develop so you're going to um, uh, develop you know like uh, in, you don't develop injury if you stop within three days no they can develop after stopping aminoglycosides as well reversible or irreversible so the moment you call aka where is that aki we have discussed initially right yeah i told the difference no aki so aka is basically reversible the moment you talk about aka it is reversible i want to write that as well if you talk about ckd it's irreversible any chronic disease chronic kidney disease chronic heart failure chronic liver failure chronic liver disease the moment you call chronic it's irreversible that's all you can't do anything you can reduce the progression to end stage disease through some measures but there will be nothing you can do about treatment so that is different okay gentamicin amikacin still commonly given practice you can give because they are very good drugs in fact they are going to act as very good synergistic drugs they produce a very good synergy with beta lactams and other drugs like vancomycin so if you give some cell wall inhibiting drugs it's not uh, with other drugs if you give with cell wall inhibiting drugs like beta lactams or probably with uh, amino uh, sorry vancomycin they have a very good synergy synergistic effect will be very good the killing effect the lock killing effect will be very good with that of aminoglycoside that's why we still use it you can reduce the bacterial load like anything in a short span of time but unfortunately it has to be monitored it's a drug that has to be monitored um, that because it has a narrow therapeutic index but nevertheless they are very very useful drugs to be honest cholesterol injury yeah cholesterol also has nephrotoxicity yeah definite nephrotoxicity there's absolutely no doubt about that cholesterol can cause serious nephrotoxicity Okay, so question number 19, all of the following statements are true regarding the condition except, I, I don't know, the image again, as usual, I forgot, but what the what is the image I've given is calciflaxis image, maybe while uploading <laughs> in the uh, Telegram channel, I will put that image also, the image was image of calciflaxis, you know what is calciflaxis, there will be a blackish necrotic area in the skin, whenever you see that in a CKD patient, it almost always indicates calciflaxis, okay like blackish necrotic area in the skin in exam in a ckd patient that is calciflaxis so which of the following statement is false that's what they're asking so oral calcium supplement may be a risk factor option a option b warfarin is a risk factor option c pathologically there is uh, vascular occlusion option d states that pseudomonas co-infection is typical so what is the other name for calciflaxis calcific uremic arteriopathy calcific uremic arteriopathy that is the definition of calciflaxis calcific uremic arteriopathy so which means what's going to happen calcific 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 means the arterioles the arterioles these are end arterioles that are supplying the skin and some organs may become calcified may become calcified because of calcification there's going to be ischemia and that ischemia is going to result in necrosis that is ischemia is going to become necrosis so vascular occlusion is correct that's a correct statement warfarin is a risk factor definitely yes that's correct so what are the risk factors for calciflaxis so there are multiple risk factors esrd itself is a risk factor that is gfr less than 15 female gender is a risk factor it occurs in more more of females compared to males presence of diabetes mellitus is a risk factor usage of warfarin is a risk factor 
and uh, obesity is a risk factor obesity is a risk factor or any thrombophilia thrombophilia is a risk factor any thrombophilia is a risk factor and finally one more thing is there what is that vitamin k deficiency vitamin k deficiency is a risk factor so in thrombophilia the most important is protein c deficiency protein c deficiency these are all risk factors ESRD, female sex, diabetes, warfarin, obesity, thrombophilia, vitamin K deficiency. These are going to be the basic risk factors. So warfarin is definitely a risk factor. Oral calcium supplement may be a risk factor. Absolutely yes. This is also a risk factor. Because it, it is based on calcification. So right answer for this is option D. Pseudomonas co-infection is typical. No. Pseudomonas tend to produce another condition in immunosuppressed people called as ectima gangrenosa. Ectema gangrenosum. That's different. So that is going to occur in patients who are very immunosuppressed. Okay, for them only you get ectema gangrenosum commonly. That's a different infection altogether. You will get in the arms, trunk, and all necrotic areas, especially in patients who are very immunosuppressed. Okay, so the right answer is D. So how will you treat? Yeah, treat, treat your calciphylaxis. So, of course, the local wound care is very important. You might need surgery. Local wound care. Very important. You may need surgery. Okay. And debridement may be needed. Antibiotics may be needed if you think it's infected. Okay. Immediately, you have to stop all the calcium and vitamin D supplements. Stop all calcium and vitamin D supplements. Whatever the patient is getting. And stop warfarin. If the patient is getting stop warfarin this is very very important basic step stop calcium stop vitamin d's and uh, stop warfarin but patient may need warfarin suppose the patient is on warfarin it's likely they might have some indication for warfarin so what is the alternative alternative is you can use doacs that is direct oral anticoagulants which doac is the best in renal failure which doac is, is best in renal failure you're going to use apic seven i'll repeat in renal failure if they ask you the best doac Based on kinetics, it is apic seven. We have four DOACs: dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apic seven, edoxaban. Among the four, the best is apic seven. Hopefully, you know, like next time when some neat exam or uh, AIMS exam is going to ask that uh, some patient with renal failure came with uh, so and so, he has been receiving warfarin. What DOAC you will consider? Something like that. The question might come. That time, this this one will become famous. I know that. Till the students won't read anyways. And that time this will become a pharmacology question. I don't know why, but nevertheless, this is going to become a pharmacology question and this is going to become applied pharmacology. Trust me. So, Apixaban is the best agent in patients with renal failure among the DOICs. The prognosis is very poor. So, once you develop this, um, usually it is, a, it is a marker of very high mortality. Like the mortality rates are going to exceed 60% in the next one year. So, it's not a very good condition to get. Coming to nephrology question number 20, last question. Which of the following fluid or electrolyte abnormalities can be seen in some patients after the relief of bilateral renal obstruction? Which of the following fluid or electrolyte abnormalities can be seen in some patients after relief of bilateral renal obstruction? Is it hyperkalemia, hypermagnesemia, hypernatremia or hypervolemia? So this is a little tricky question but let me see like how many of you are going to answer this. Little tricky, but let us see how many of you are going to answer this. Hyperkalemia, hypermagnesemia, hypernatremia, hypervolemia. So remember, usually after relief of obstruction, this is going to result in something called as post-obstructive diuresis. That's going to result in something called post-obstructive diuresis. After relief of obstruction, there will be massive diuresis. And this can occur after 18 also can occur after 18 acute tubular necrosis there are two things post obstructive diuresis as well as post 18 diuresis that is post acute tubular necrosis diuresis post obstructive diuresis and post acute tubular necrosis diuresis also post 18 and post obstructive so here the patient will lose plenty of water there will be too, so much of water and electrolyte loss so much of water and electrolyte loss because of lot of electrolyte losses, patient can develop 
hypokalemia patients are going to develop hypomagnesemia and patients can develop hypocalcemia also because of electrolyte losses but look at water losses this patient will have massive water losses lots of water losses so whenever there is too much of water loss more than everything your sodium will be affected so only thing that's going to increase is sodium hypernatremia okay that's what we're going to see because of water and electrolyte losses patient will develop hypovolemia that's true not hypervolemia because of post obstructive diuresis once you relieve the obstruction there will be diuresis and there the patient will lose lots of water and electrolytes even though they lose sodium in the urine but because the water loss is too much and serum sodium is always a measure of how much water is there in the system if you're going to lose too much of water you're going to end up with hypernatremia in fact this is a very 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 okay common thing that we see in practice so this can occur after atn resolution for example a patient develops an acute tubular necrosis and after that also patients can develop um, hypernatremia that's very common i mean let me tell you a case example which which condition we can expect now let me tell you a case example i've got a 20 year old like young boy okay he's a young boy i would say 20 year old he came with uh, fever his complaint was fever that's all nothing more than that and he, he was using psychiatric medications he was using this is my own case okay let me tell you this, this is the case that came just two two uh, two weeks ago psychiatric patient he was on risperidone already and investigations we did a basic investigation because he was very febrile we admitted him so we did a basic preliminary investigation his dengo igm was positive Dengue IgM was positive, but I don't take this as a big deal because they have already done it outside. I didn't do it because this patient is having a day four fever. So this Dengue IgM positivity in a day four fever is extremely unlikely. So usually either NS1 will be positive at this time or IgM will be negative. So it's unlikely. So this must be very likely to be an old infection. Maybe in the last 90 days or 120 days, you would have got an infection. And then what we did what we did is we did screen for other things because his crp we did a crp it was 150 and uh, usually in a viral infection crp levels will be like 30 40 if they go for dac also it will be 70 but 150 clinically speaking it's very high it suggests you of a very uh, high grade bacterial infection so we did blood cultures so we did blood cultures because he had severe diarrhea also so presentation is not only fever patient is having severe diarrhea for the last so many days severe diarrhea so we did a blood culture so we did blood culture it grew salmonella typhi so this is the gold standard so salmonella typhi gold standard this is an enteric fever for sure that correlates with the severe diarrhea also that correlates with the fever also and that correlates with the very high crp also so straightforward that's typically an enteric fever there's no doubt about that and patients developed one episode of shock before admission so this is that's all the history presentation with shock so he had a bp of somewhere on maybe 80 40 at the time of presentation and his for his body weight it's very low because his body weight is like he was obese boy he was a young obese boy his body weight was like 104 105 kilograms so for his body weight, this is definitely a shock and his pulse rate at the time of admission was 150 per minute it was a sinus tachycardia okay so what it is we did with fluid resuscitation and this shock settled down fluid resuscitation and he was okay okay what we did is initially his creatinine was okay like in the first two days then after all this is happening he developed oliguria all this is happening at the same time simultaneously he developed oliguria so we did a renal function the creatinine rose up to 7.9 within two days 7.9 trust me this is the creatinine sudden rise in serum creatinine we couldn't understand what's really happening with such a high serum creatinine 7.9 so what initially I thought is this shock could be the reason because shock could have caused acute tubular necrosis. Okay, sudden shock. It, I mean, many people think of prenatal AK, but if the shock is very severe, patients can develop acute kidney injury because of acute tubular necrosis if it's a severe shock. So probably that could be the reason I thought, but 7.9 again is pitching my mind. So it's very unlikely to get a creatinine of 7.9 that in a couple of days, there must be something else going on. So after extensive workup, Okay, after extensive workup, we did uh, CPK, okay, creatinine phosphokinase. This is the only thing that was positive. It is 1.2 lakhs. 
1.2 lakh CP goes 1.2. I've seen up to 2 lakhs also the CPK values, but here it was 1.2 lakhs. So definitely it's a clear cut rhabdo analysis, no doubt about that. And that explains why we are seeing such a high creatinine, even though shock could be the reason for acute tubular necrosis. But see, remember muscles have creatinine. That's why in rhabdo analysis patients, the creatinine levels tend to peak up very fast. Why? It's not just because of the kidney injury. It's because the muscles themselves are releasing creatinine outside. So that's the reason usually in rhabdomolysis we see very high creatinine. It starts picking up very very fast because muscles actively release creatinine because it's the, it's coming from them. That explains okay why serum creatinine is very high. Slowly slowly he had a very, very eventful course like we did so many things. He was there in the hospital for almost like 13 days and slowly his creatinine started recovering. And urine output initially was completely oliguric. In fact aneuric. We started with renal replacement therapy. He underwent like maybe five to six sessions of dialysis for renal replacement therapy because it's an acute kidney injury. And rhabdomolysis, you can ask why did this patient develop rhabdomolysis? It's because of constellation of multiple reasons. Initially, he had a shock, right? This shock could have caused ischemia to the muscle. Okay, muscle ischemia, possible one reason. Second reason, he was taking risperidone also, which could have augmented the rhabdomolysis. So it's multifactorial. I cannot say point out a single reason in this case. It's combination of both shock and risperidone that's increasing the muscle contraction. So that both muscle increasing muscle contraction with ischemia due to shock can would have accelerated the rhabdomolysis. So somehow he underwent RRT for five to six sessions. And after that, what we did, we um, I mean we didn't do anything. It's just a conservative management. We gave antibiotics for salmonella typhi because it's a blood culture growth. We started with ceftriaxone. It was sensitive for ceftriaxone. We gave for like 13 to 14 days and the fever got settled over time but the kidney didn't recover slowly it recovered once it recovered patient developed polyuria his urine output you don't believe it was five six liters per day for almost three days five six liters that's why once kidneys recover they recover very nicely especially in after atn they have diuresis there are a lot of reasons for that i cannot say the kidneys have recovered but the tubular function will take some time and the cast obstruction and all are gone. That cast and all would have gone. So the fluid, like just like that, plunges out. Dialysis further decreased the BP. I told you know the shock uh, was resolved with fluid resuscitation. So what is the problem? So why can't you do dialysis? Dialysis in this case, you can do dialysis. So even if the patient is in shock, you can do techniques like CRRT. So it's not like we can't do dialysis. We can do continuous renal replacement therapy, which is tailor made for patients who are suffering from shock states. So this patient had polyuria. 5 to 6 liters per day of urine just plunging out without any diuretic agents because the kidneys are recovering. This is called as post acute tubular necrosis diuresis, which is expected. And you know one thing patient developed hypokalemia, patient developed hypomagnesemia, and patient developed calcium was fortunately fine. That patient did not develop hypocalcemia, and so, so sodium was very, very, very high. Sodium levels were almost like um, I think he got 162 at one point then you know what do you do for hyponatremia hypernatremia you give five percent dextrose this is the treatment we use five percent dextrose for hypernatremia because the kidneys are working fine i don't have any problem plus at the same time this is a water only not sodium so kidneys are already excreting well so it's not a problem at all so five percent dextrose we gave like two to three liters of five percent dextrose and this sodium ultimately came down to 141 something like that so within a day we recovered it so we stopped it that's what I'm trying trying to tell. So this case had a like completely uh, okay course and uh, his final discharge keratin was 0.7 I guess yeah. Discharge keratin was 0.7. So he came back to normal from I mean the peak creatinin was around like 11.4 not 11.5 I think 12.4 the peak creatinin. Here half NS is not required if the patient probably is having hypolemia then we can give half NS but uh, in patients who are not hypolemic you can give. 5% dextrose. Yes, we have corrected hypokalemia also with case potassium chloride. Okay, so that separately was given. We are given half NS along with KCL injection separately. Okay, that was corrected as well. So that's not a problem. So KCL generally we don't give with 5% dextrose because dextrose anyway is going to increase the insulin release. Once you increase the insulin release from the pancreas because you are giving dextrose that can push potassium into the cell and cause more hypokalemia. So KCL better to give with either normal saline or half normal saline. But this patient had hypernatremia, right? So we gave half normal saline. 
no, not the usual normal saline because the patient had hypernatremia. So that will have additional effect on hypernatremia correction also. So this is what we tried. And ultimately, patient record and uh, they got discharged with the creatinine of 0.7. And uh, he came for review like just a week ago, I guess. That's why like after post obstructive diuresis and after post atrial di diuresis, you commonly observe hypernatremia because of heavy water losses. I mean, why I have told this is because this is a like important thing that's mentioned in the like first line of Harrison, like in the post obstructive diuresis or post atrial diuresis. Hypernatremia is so common. Patient will develop hypovolemia because of losses. Patient will develop hypermagnesemia and I mean hypomagnesemia. Patient can develop hypokalemia and patient can develop hypocalcemia also. Okay, so but um, hypernatremia is also something that's very important so that you need to understand that as well. So hopefully you enjoyed the session. It's a long session, I agree, but uh, it's a high yielding session. The 20 areas, whatever I discussed, are going to be extremely important. Concentrate on your like topics more than the questions itself. Questions are just a model. The same model questions might come, but the topics are topics are going to be the most important. Okay. Study the topics sincerely. Don't ignore them. And thank you very much, Dr. Avinash, Dr. Meet. Thank you very much, Dr. Karthik, Dr. Sagala. Okay, she mentioned Oreo. Thank you so much. She's sleeping in the home. And thank you so much, everyone. Okay, see you all. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night.